So did you get your bucket of um, note cards with adjectives on them? <laughs> I just saw your note, that's cute. <laughs> no, I don't need that. So, uh, <laughs> it, uh, it'll be real easy. So how was your trip to uh, Florida? I saw something on Facebook that you had a good time hitting all the twist places on the way home. I, um, let's see, what did I do? I went to, I, I, I was in Gulf Shores, Alabama for five weeks with my girlfriend. And um, actually we paid for six, couldn't get out of here. I, I got COVID and, then, and then, uh, then it snowed so badly we couldn't leave for two days. So anyway, we got, we got down there extended a week. And then while we were down there, I drove over to St. Petersburg to see Glenn, good buddy. I've known him since 1985. Um, How's he doing now after his heart problems? He's, he's fine. He's fine. He was in the hospital for a while. Gail said that, that they drained a liter and a half, two liters of fluid for, from, or, you know, from within his pleural sac. Oh, my God. <laughs> Almost drowning. You can't live with that kind of fluid around your lungs. Anyway, no. he, he's back. Uh, she had a picture of him up playing his trombone at some event. So he's got his wind back and everything. He, his, his eyes look in that picture that I sent. He's, his eyes look dark. Um, he lost a lot of weight, hell of a way, <laughs> hell of a way to lose weight, being in the hospital on and off for a month. Um, but anyway, that, that was fun down there. And I, in fact, I did go visit some people in Ocala, whose surname is Twist. <laughs> Uh, including the daughter uh, who's uh, in prison for life for felony murder, went to see her. She's wow. 50, nice gal, you know, the errors of youth, she's 20, you know, yep. and uh, sort of was driving the car, you know, and but that's that's the way the law goes. And um, and then when we're coming back up, um, yeah, I had to stop by Twist, Ar <laughs> Twist Arkansas. Uh, there wasn't even a sign that said, welcome to Twist Arkansas on both sides. I mean, it was just a bump in the road. It used to be <laughs> a huge place, a 50,000 foot, uh, 50,000 acre uh, plantation. It was, wow. it was big time, but that, that was, everything changes. This is now. So yep. they, they, lost their, uh, they lost their zip code. So now they're tied in with <laughs> Earl. Which is oh my gosh, what a you know there's certain places you drive around out in the country, probably anywhere, but I I know in the south that it's it's really poor. It's really really. Poor. Yep. Nice to nice um, to, to get home. Well, that's good, and you had a safe drive, and everything was uneventful. Yes. Yep. Yep. No uh, no cars whirling by us. I'm going to change my uh, background. I look all washed out here. Okay. See what I can come up with for a background. Maybe I'll get, what about none? Oh, I still look washed out. Oh my gosh, is it a light or what? Oh my gosh. Didn't you get some sun when you were down in Florida? No, no. No, I've been taking the pale man's pills, I guess. Holy Toledo, <laughs> I got no color in me at all. Usually my face is all red, but not tonight. So. Well, shall we call you Casper? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's see, what, what, what can I find here uh, for a background? So, something nice. I'm better, better looking than this guy though. Well, that's true. I think he'll scare us if you have that guy up there. Uh, is that, does that read backwards to you? Um, yes. Upside down. Uh, that that's, that reads that right. That's correct. All right. I'm just going to have to be washed out then, I guess. Okay. Well, well, maybe what? we'll ask some questions if you'll get your blood pressure up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, let's see. What time is it? We got a few more minutes oh, here. We got a few more minutes. We got eight people on now. Um, John, you asked me, right, if, if I could keep track of, of who was on. Um, but um, I don't, I don't think that um, I can, I, I mean, I, I, I can't, um, if, if, can you go to participant and see who's on? Yeah, I, I can do it. I, I've got okay. the participants list. Yeah, John, John wanted to have a clue to see if there were, right, we, we almost got 10 people now. Right, yeah, no, I, I'm, his, um, I'm his person counter. 
And okay. uh, I've got a list. Look at this. I got the Car Club agenda. If I can show it to you. I mean, hey. a membership. Okay. And I'm going to mark them off as I see their names. Great. Oh, wait. Hey, Penny, how are things at the vineyard? Say again, Ken. I was asking uh, Penny. She supported one of our Zoom sessions uh, during the midst of the pandemic. We had a wine tasting virtually. Alexander Vineyards. You know, I think I got just... that right, didn't I? Yep, Alexander Valley. I went through a whole case of Chardonnay. I need to place another order. All right, <laughs> there you go. You know, Chardonnay just... We just had the Chardonnay leafing out today. My uh, my daughter was here during a lot of the pandemic. She was in New York City, and they were talking about closing down the city. And what did that mean? Ringing it with National Guard and people couldn't come or go. So I drove out and got her. And then she was here with her cat for, well, I don't know, nine months or something. And um, uh, what, what was the point? Oh, she, she'd get online and have these virtual parties with people. And, you know, you don't have to drive home. <laughs> you know, you stumble, <laughs> stumble to your bedroom. I think the motto was drink, don't drive. <laughs> well, it's seven o'clock. So, um, John, I, I think you wanted to, to start off and say a few words. Well, actually, I'm going to start off and he's going to end it. How about that? All right. OK. Well, good evening, everyone. It gives me great pleasure tonight to welcome you to our MG Car Club Zoom tech session conducted by John Twist. John's name is synonymous with the MG Mark. He is the guru of all MG mechanics, a member of the British Sports Car Hall of Fame and co-founder of the North American um, MGB Register. You may have met John at our recent Hunt Country Classic Car Show last October, where we were fortunate enough to have him in attendance. We all know that working on classic MGs is much simpler than working on our modern cars because of engine components are more accessible and a computer is not the brains of the car. However, as most of you know, solving the mystery of perfect carburetor adjustment is something we all strive for. To simplify matters by not having to take copious notes, John is recording the Zoom call and will tell us later how we can find it on YouTube. To save your specific questions for on carbs for John until after his tutorial. Also to observe Zoom call etiquette, Please meet, mute, I'm sorry, mute your volume unless you are talking to minimize background noise. John, it's all yours. Okay, well, welcome, welcome. We got another person just coming on now. People come on and, and uh, come off as they have to. So I have, a, I have the power button here. I've got a button that says mute all and I'm pressing it now. It's not because I don't like you, but there's always background noise. Either someone's doing the dishes or somebody wonders where you are, your granddaughter's trying to help you get your computer operational. So um, anyway, hit mute all. Now the way to, to, to talk and come up um, is um, to either go to the bottom ribbon, that's why it works on mine, the bottom ribbon on, on, on the toolbar and unmute yourself. That's a cumbersome way of doing it. Or catch this, all you have to do is press down on the space bar while you're speaking, and when you release the space bar, you go back to muted. So, and if there's background noise, I'll just hit mute all. And it's a it's a small group here. We'll all, all get along. It'll all work. Um, even for um, uh, the 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 person who's come in by telephone only at uh, 0920. So for everybody else here, you know, we'd love to see you if, if we can. Um, anyway, I've been asked tonight to talk a little bit about carburetor adjustment, and um, I'll try to make it re really simple. I want to say it is, but there's an art to it. It's like tuning a piano. I mean, you get. I mean, it used to be you'd hold a tuning fork next to your ear and turn the, you know, turn the uh, the screw until the vibrations were the same. You needed a good ear for that. Now they got machines, you cheat. Um, they got good and bad. I saw someone tuning up a harp 
I said, isn't that cheating? Using, <laughs> using a, it was like this, some little oscilloscope thing. Anyway, um, SUs require a certain amount of art, but I'll try to make the practical part of it easy for you to understand. So the carburation fuel system is the last thing that you come to in the tune-up. There are four parts of the tune-up. If my background starts to get hinky here, I'll, I'll just turn it off. But uh, as long as I have my hand in front of me, there are four parts of the tune-up. The first part is, is emissions. You go, well, I, I got a 1949 TC. I don't have any emissions. Yes, you do. You've got an oil draft tube. You got a hole in the in the um, valve cover that goes into the air cleaner. Yes, you do have emissions. They're crude. They're really crude, and that it stays that way until 1964 on the MGB with an oil draft tube off the side of the engine. And then we get a Smith's PCV valve through 68, and then in 69 we're vented into the carburetors, um, and then um, then it's uh, Starts to we start to pick up a charcoal canister in 1970 and 73 we get an anti run on valve and by 77 or 78 we've got two charcoal canisters and it starts to look you know it started off looking like a crystal radio set now it looks like the back of a color TV although I don't know they all look the same now I just talked to somebody the other day and I talked about black and white television I thought you probably can't even get that anymore anyway. Um, the carburetion is the last thing that you come to. The first one is emissions, and you got to check and make sure that the emissions are okay. And also that there are no leaks. Air leaks are, are absolutely impossible to overcome by tuning, except for tiny leaks around the throttle shafts. All throttle shafts leak. All of them leak. They have to, uh, because you've got a, a shaft going, going through a, a bushing. So there's always going to be some leaking. You just don't want very much. So with a can of spray carburetor cleaner, you can spray between the head, the manifold, the manifold, the heat shield, the heat shield, and spacer blocks, spacer blocks and carburetors all around the carburetors, any hoses that come to and from the carburetors, between the um, servo and the master cylinder on the brake booster, um, any place that any hoses might go. And if you can get the RPM of the engine to change, especially change dramatically, by spraying carburetor cleaner, you've got a, you know you've got a leak because that leak is allowing the carburetor cleaner to come in, change the speed of the engine, and determining and determining determined um, determined by the severity of the of the RPM change, you know maybe you got to take care of it. If you can kill the engine by spraying carburetor cleaner somewhere behind the carburetors, you got to take care of that first. There's no way that you're going to tune through that. You got to make sure you get fresh oil because uh, old oil's got gasoline in it, and that'll cause the mixture to run too rich. Um, and you want to have fresh gasoline. There's no point trying to tune up a car with two-year-old gasoline. Gasoline has a shelf life of, of about six months. Um, once it, the engine's hot, it'll continue to run. But if it gets cold again, uh, there's just not enough lightweight, volatile components in the gasoline to evaporate and get ignition going. So, you know, always tune the car with the gasoline that you're going to use. Um, make sure the fan belt's tight, just little stuff like that. Then you got the condition of the engine. So you got to have consistent compression, at least that, um, and consistent by how much? By about 10%, you know, 145 on one, um, 130 on another. That's pretty wide range. That's, 15 pounds on one, 145, that's your full 10%. Um, anyway, you wanna have consistent compression. You wanna have, I always include spark plugs in the engine because they, they fit in the engine. I know they're part of the, part of the uh, ignition system, but make sure you're running the correct spark plugs um, from the um, halfway through the TD production, you get N5 spark plugs and that runs all the way through the MGAs. And then you go to N9Ys and the MGBs and MGCs, N12Ys and the midget 1500s. Um, the earlier ones, other early, real early cars, the TCs and the real early TDs take a half inch plug in L, L87, L85. In all those cases, you want to gap that spark plug at 35 thousandths. Um, 
that's my experience. Uh, with a larger gap, you get a little hotter spark and the chance of that plug fouling out is less. So that's what, what I do. Then you gotta make sure your dwell is correct. If you've got points, points are better than electronic. But uh, if you got point, if you have points, you got to make sure your dwell is 60 degrees. Use a dwell meter or pull the distributor out. And make sure your gap is 15 thousandths. And then you got to time it. Timing is critical. No one would ever say, "Well, I didn't talk about adjusting the valves," but you can torque the head and adjust the valves. Actually, if you go on my website, there's a uh, on the top ribbon there. It, it's, there's a thing that says. Uh, uh, resource, uh, resources, pages, uh, doc forms. I, don't know, I just looked at it. I can't remember. Anyway, um, there's a complete tune-up list on there. So just the valves makes sense too. Anyway, you're after the consistent compression, and then after that, you're after the after the uh, spark plug gap, and after that, you're looking for the right timing. Now, when it says adjust the 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 valve lash to 13 thousandths, your buddy, do, your buddy does come, comes by, doesn't, does not come by and say, well, let's try it at 18 thousandths and see if it runs better. Let's try it at eight thousandths and see if that runs better. No one does that. You set it right to the spec. That's exactly the truth with the timing. And the timing in all of our cars, 1945 through 1980, with the exception of the MGB GT V8, and the MGA twin cam, the timing is 32 degrees before top dead center at full mechanical advance at some around 4,000 RPM vacuum disconnected. It has to do with the head, with the, the, the way the head is constructed. That's 32 degrees before. And you can either do that with a dial back timing light. Sometimes you can use just a regular timing light, but the timing has to be correct. Once this is all done, the emissions and the preliminaries, the engine and the ignition, then you can go over to the carburetors. So the carburetors have to do the same thing at the same time. If you've got two, if you've got one, it's a whole lot easier. Um, so you want to clean them first. If you take the suction chambers off, uh, you can clean all the varnish that's on the inside of it, the dirt, the grunge and so forth. And then you wonder, well, I wonder if the last person that took this apart got the air pistons mixed up between the suction chambers. So I use tape over the ventilation holes and uh, put them up in the, in the suction chambers and then allow them to, to drop. And I wanna make sure they're dropping it at the same rate. There's a picture in your workshop manual about how to do that. Um, but I, I just use um, masking tape on the on the bottom of the piston. You got to be careful you don't drop the piston with a needle in it because you can't. You can you can get if the needle's just a little you know you're spinning it and it wobbles just a little bit. You can take that out, but you can't you can't you can't straighten the needle that's been dropped on a concrete floor. I've I've tried. Um, so anyway, you want to make sure that the piston drop is, is the same. You want to make sure that the float bowls are clean and the float height is correct. And I just talked to a guy who could not get his car to run above, I don't know, sort of maxed out at 3000 RPM or something under load. And we went back and forth a couple of days and he said he dropped the float level or uh, raised the float level rather. And he said, it's, it runs like a, a rocket now. So um, the float height on an HS carburetor is supposed to be one eighth to three sixteenths. Um, but you know, you can fiddle around a, a little bit. You can argue all day that modern gasoline with 10% alcohol is, hasn't got as much energy per gallon as real gasoline does, and maybe you've got to, you know, maybe in some cases you, you've got to raise the, the height. So that that's a number that that is is relatively fixed, one eighth to three sixteenths um, on an HS carburetor, but you can fiddle with that a little bit. HIF carburetors, oh boy, anytime you do anything with that, you got to take them off the car. I hate those carburetors. They're just awful. If they leak, you got to take them off the car. If you want to reset the float height, you got to take them off the car. So I'm real good at it. I can get them on and off real quickly, but oh, what a hassle. So in a Stromberg carburetor, um, there's no, no consideration here, although the float level is a consideration. 
on the Stromberg carburetor, if you have that apart and you let the float come down, there's a casting line on the float itself, and that should be par parallel with the bottom of the carburetor body. I got the carburetor turned upside down and the floats fallen down. And there's a measurement that's given five eighths of an inch or 10, I don't know, some metric. Um, and, uh, but if you just look at the casting line, look at the casting line in the, in the float, that should be parallel with the, with the uh, bottom of the carburetor. And that really does make a difference if you get that buggered up. Um, sometimes it runs too rich or too lean, depending on whether it's too high or too low. So anyway, now that we've got the carburetors clean and, and uh, the, we're sure that the float heights are, are correct, then you should always check the fuel flow, take the, take the line off the carburetor, put it into a can or a bottle, turn on the key, and you should pump out a pint, a pint of fuel in a minute. I mean, you should get, you should get a, you know, I mean, you're not gonna pump out all that. You're, you're gonna make a judicious uh, estimate from, from the pumping, but it, it's either just trickling out, which means you're gonna run out of fuel at high speed, or it's spurt, 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 you know, every time that electric fuel pump cycles, it pushes out about a tablespoon of fuel. And when it's running with no prohibition at all, it's moving a lot of fuel. We're up to 22 people now. So anyway, check the fuel filter, or check the fuel, and change the fuel filter if you, if you feel it's necessary. You should always get a see-through fuel filter. My gosh, why would you get one you can't see through? You know, you've got no, no idea what kind of shape the inside of the tank's in or if, if it's plugged up. So now we've got two carburetors. They both have to do exactly the same thing. So we separate the two carburetors. Uh, in the case of an MGA or a T-type, uh, there's little uh, uh, accordion-shaped jobs between the, the linkage. Back one of those off so that each carburetor can work independently of the other. And in the case of the MGBs, midgets, um, 62 through uh, 74, um, you back off the little adjuster fingers and, and work, the, work the throttles independently of, of each other. So the first thing to do is to get both of the carburetors drafting the same amount of air. So you can either use a tube, you know, from your ear, that's what I use, and listen to the but sometimes the pitch changes. Sometimes it's a high pitch and sometimes it's low pitch and you're listening for the intensity. So sometimes that isn't a, a good way, especially if you're, you got any kind of hearing impairment. So you can buy a unison, you just put up against the carburetor and the little ball. Um, there's other ones too with little veins on them. There's all uh, two or three different styles, but the bottom line is that idle, idling at around 800 RPM, you want both carburetors to draft the same amount of air. After you're there, then you want to make sure that the mixture in each carburetor is correct. So you take a screwdriver, push it down the throat of the, of the, uh, between the bridge and the air piston, turn the screwdriver, turn the screwdriver, and that'll just touch, just touch and start to disturb the position of the air piston. Now the workshop manual says lift the air piston nine, three sixty fourths of an inch. It's like the engine's doing this. How could you can't? So anyway, I'm telling you, just put a screwdriver down inside there, not your finger, because that disturbs the airflow. But just a, a a screwdriver, a little screwdriver down underneath the air piston, rotate it, and lift the air piston. When you do that, it leans out the mixture, and one of three things is going to happen. If you're already too lean then the, the car is gonna stumble and fall because it's not running well now and it's gonna run worse. If it's too rich, then by lifting the air piston, you're gonna lean it out, it's gonna run better, faster, faster, faster. What you're looking for is an increase of about 50 RPM and then the RPMs fall away. If you've got a moving coil tacked well, that's one with a needle on it, you can watch it. It'll, it'll lift about 50 RPM. So you, you move the jet up to lean it, move the jet down to enrich in it. That's all the way up through 1971. Uh, the HIF carburetors have got a screwdriver that comes in from the, from the side, um, the front and rear, and you turn them clockwise, it makes them rich. 
start with start with gross adjustments. You know, like if it's running too rich or too lean, you know, move the thing a, a turn or so, and then rev it up and blow it out. Ram, ram. Let it come back down. Try it again. So you do full turns, half turns, and finally third turns or flats, six flats to a turn. That's a British standard cycle thread on that adjuster down there. So that's um, 32 threads per inch. So one turn is, is oh, I don't know, what, 40 thousandths and, and um, well, 26 threads per inch, excuse me. British cycle thread is 26 threads per inch. So each turn is worth about 40 thousandths of an inch. So each flat's worth about seven thousandths, like twice the thickness of a hair. So you're making some pretty fine adjustments by turning that nut underneath there and moving the jet up and down. So eventually you, you dial it in and where it's running uh, so that as you just barely hit that air piston, you get that rise and then a falling away of, of the RPM. Now, you, if it wasn't very close to start with, the engine's going to be running faster now because it's running more efficiently. So you may have to set the idle back down. You may have to turn both carburetors back an eighth of a turn, a quarter of a turn, half a turn, something or other to get you back down to eight, 800 RPM. And then you go after the second carburetor. When you're done with both carburetors, you work them back and forth, lift the first piston, lift the rear piston, the front, the rear. Hey, it's great. You know, it's doing just what it's supposed to do. They're both drafting the same, and now the mixture's the same. So at this point, if you want, you can, you can uh, shut the car off and uh, adjust, the, um, adjust the fingers on the Bs and the midgets, the pre-75 MGBs, and the MG midgets with the 1275s or 1098s um, engines and get those fingers so that as you rotate the, the, the rod that goes between the two carburetors, that's operated by the throttle cable, that both carburetors open at exactly the same time. Here you spent all this time to make it, make it just so precise. You don't want one carburetor to open and be open 10 degrees before the, the other one comes in. You want them both opening at exactly the same time. Take, the, take any excess travel you've got out of the throttle cable um, so that now when you just when you wrote, go to rotate that, that interconnecting link, it, it catches both carbs at the same time. I'll talk about the Stromberg's in just a minute. Our last, our last adjustment on the SU carburetors is to get the fast idle the same. So now um, you can either work with someone who's sitting in the, in the driver's seat to pull the choke out until it runs the fastest. Does that mean 900 RPM? Does that mean 3,800 RPM? Wherever, pull it out until it runs the fastest. Then use the screws underneath on the HSs or the screws up on top on the HIFs to adjust both carburetors so they're both drafting the same amount of air and running at whatever's comfortable to you, somewhere between 15 and 1800 RPM. But if you pull the choke out too far, then the mixture starts to interfere and it starts to slow it back down again because you're getting way too much gasoline. So you're just looking for that sweet spot where it's running the fastest. When it's really cold out, it'll, it'll hit 1800, 15, 1800 RPM on full choke because it's so, so cold outside. So that's it. That's all there is to it. Put the air cleaners on, go out and drive it, make sure it's okay. You put the air cleaners on, make sure that the five holes, the, the, the big throttle hole, the two screw holes and the ventilation holes are all in, the, all in the correct spot. Let me go over and talk about the Stromberg carburetor for a minute. That's only one carburetor, so there's no balancing that you have to do. But guess what? You can still use that screwdriver approach and turn it and get that little tiny increase in RPM. But you won't be able to get it to rev past probably 3, 3,500 RPM because the air cleaner has to be on the car for it to work. Go figure. Um, so you can also do a mixture adjustment with the air cleaner on by unscrewing the damper on top 
angling the, top, the damper off to the side so it wedges against the air piston and pick it up just a touch, just a touch. You can feel it pull the air, air, air piston up and that will lean out the mixture and you can make your judgment about, the, about uh, whether you have to, to move, in this case, the needle up, up or down. And there's that tool and the people with a Stromberg know what it is, the, the little barrel that catches the air piston so you don't tear the diaphragm and the eighth inch Allen wrench that goes down inside. And you've got about three or four at the most full turns um, between pushing the needle all, all the way down into the jet and pulling it up out of the jet as far as it'll go. So, and also on the Stromberg car carburetor, you cannot adjust the throttle cable until it's until you're all set. Leave the throttle cable loose until it's all set, and then um, um, tighten it up, leaving a little bit of slack while the engine's idling. While it's idling, also on that Stromberg, when you start it up on choke, um, again you're looking for 15, 1800 RPM, and you do you adjust that with the ring-loaded screw on the linkage. Once the carburetors come up to temperature, then you make any future adjustments to get it back down to idle 800, wherever you want idle to be. Remember, I, race cars idle at three, 4,000 RPM, right? That's probably a little high for your passenger car, you know, driving. Can you, can you drive on I-95 yet? Those truckers still there? Um, if you were to choose to drive on I-95 with your MG anyway. Um, anyway, you, you adjust the um, fast idle with the spring-loaded screw. You adjust the regular idle with the lock-nutted screw. And then once that's set, make any future adjustment off the spring-loaded screw. So you gotta make sure your air cleaners are clean. Um, the oil in the top of the carburetor, uh, the workshop manual says use engine oil. We've seen brake fluid. I don't think I ever saw antifreeze, but I saw brake fluid because um, that when it squirts up, then it takes the paint off the underside of the bonnet. Um, and then uh, we've seen automatic tr transmission fluid because uh, that's, that's reddish, you know, in color. And then we've seen what must be three in one oil, real lightweight stuff. Me, I'm a fan of 90 weight gear oil, real thick stuff real thick stuff. You know, every carburetor has to have an accelerator pump. Well, every carburetor has to enrich in the mixture at the point of acceleration. So most carburetors have got an accelerator pump. You, know, you put your foot to the floor and there's a diaphragm and it squirts, it's just crude and rude, squirts gasoline into the intake manifold because you need a rich mixture right at acceleration. So we don't have accelerator pumps. Pumping the throttle doesn't do anything except exercise your, your, your ankle. Um, instead, we've got this thick oil in the dash pot, which restricts the upward motion of that air piston. Not by much. I don't know, if, it, if with no oil and it pops up in a 10th of a second um, and you've got oil in it and it takes a second and a half, it just, it just restricts the, upward motion of that air piston long enough to get you going, to, to get the rich mixture on acceleration. And then it, then it just stabilizes. Um, the air piston isn't gonna rise, isn't gonna sit higher or lower no, as an account, on account of the type of oil that's in there. It's only how quickly does it rise. So I would encourage you all to try to use 90 weight. Then the Stromberg carburetor has got an O-ring because you got, you, when you put that tool down the top and turn it, um, there's a barrel down there and it, it sits at the bottom of the dash pot. It's got a number eight, I think, O-ring on it. Those fail. And then the oil gets sucked out of there because the, you just cannot imagine the vacuum uh, at the bottom of the air piston. It's just enormous because it's sucking the gasoline out of the carburetor. Actually, there's no sucking at all, right? It's all pressure. There's no such thing as vacuum. There's only pressure. There's no such thing as, as cold. There's only heat. And there's no such thing as dark. There's only light or lack thereof. Anyway, it's easier to talk about sucking fuel out of the jet. Um, so 
Oh, I don't know what, where, where, where I was. Anyway, um, you've got to get that, that fuel out, out of the jet and, um, and operational for, for that acceleration. So try that 90 weight. Oh, the 90, the, the 90 weight in the, in the Stromberg. Um, usually you lose that oil and the SU carburetors just offhand. You don't and can't lose oil. So you don't need to replenish SU carburetors. Once they're filled, that's good. Whatever's excess will come out the little breather hole at the top, lubricate the linkage on the carburetors. And, um, and as long as when you push that, the, the uh, plunger back in, that AUC 8113 plunger back in there, uh, as long as you can feel some restriction right at the very bottom of it, that's all the oil that you need. Stromberg's whole different deal. They, 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 can, they can draw all that oil out of that dash pot in, in, a, in a half a tank of gas. So if you're having a problem, either you got to carry oil with you, or if you don't mind foraging in the trash at the gas station, uh, you, can, you can look in the trash and somebody else has already bought a, a quart of oil and has been in a hurry, and there's just enough left in that oil can for you to drool into your, into your carburetor, but it's not 90 weight. 90 weight works a whole lot better. So that's it. Easy, easy schmeasy. Um, you, you've got to get the airflow, the mixture, and then you got to get both carburetors operating at the same time, and you've got to get the, uh, uh, the fast idle sorted out, and that's all there is to it. So, but sometimes it can be, it can argue with you. <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy, I'm happy to entertain any questions that you have about anything on any MG, but um, but tuning certainly because that's that's what we're talking about tonight. Let's see. Oh, I got some stuff here on chat. Okay. Any safety issue with spraying carburetor cleaner while the engine's running? Not that I know of. I, I've never had a problem. If in the bizarre case you're spraying it down the throat of the carburetor, which you don't need to do, and you're revving it at the same time, and some if the, it's running lean. For whatever reason, because it's cold, and the carburetors flash back and go <laughs> with uh, the shoot flame out of them. You, you could get a pretty good size flame out of that, but you're just spraying it around while it's idling. So no, there's no safety issues. And see, Penny is the spark plug the same with points versus protronics? Yes, thirty-five thousands. Oh, I was going to comment on that too. If you get a T-type with an original coil. Coils do go bad over a long period of time, usually. And um, um, sometimes you don't get enough spark out of them. But if you open up your, your spark gap to 35,000, so now the car doesn't run well, time to get a new coil. Uh, and in all cases, positive or negative earth, the negative side of the coil goes to the distributor. Negative goes to the distributor, always. Um, and then if you've got the original style coil, it's marked CB and SW, just, just for fun. CB stands for contact breaker, which is the points, the distributor, SW, is the white wire that comes from the switch, SW. So anyway, but no, it's 35 thousandths in, in, uh, in both cases, in all cases. So Doug, Doug will fire the little lift pin on the SUs. When lifted up uh, to the bottom of the carb, does this raise the piston by the correct amount? No, no, it, raise, it, it depends on how it's sit in there and how long the pins are and, and so forth. Those are easy to lift. You can um, lift those uh, with your finger or with a screwdriver while the engine's running with the air cleaners on. But the problem is, as you're lifting up, when does it hit the air piston? When does it hit the air piston? Well. If the RPM rises, you know, all of a sudden starts rising up a whole lot, well, yeah, obviously it's hitting the piston. If it stumbles and falls, it's hitting the air piston. But you really can't get a good feel for it. That's why I like having the air, air cleaners off. Um, um, let's see. Anyway, I, I stopped partway through there. Are these e easier to lift with a, um, when the air cleaners are on. So all the emission and filter contribution of the mixture can be factored in. Yes, although there shouldn't be any difference whether you put air cleaners on there or not. The air cleaners should not afford any 
restriction to the airflow that said, remember the Stromberg won't run without the air cleaner. So that's an essential part of, of the carburetor. Actually, on MGBs, that little aluminum disc with the radius on it uh, that, that goes in there, that is part of the carburetor. And that's, that, that is, is just unbelievable. That's good for two horsepower. Now, two horsepower on what? Well, a really well-tuned MGB gets about 60 horsepower at the rear wheels. What? I thought it was 98. I thought it was 140. All my friends, 60 at the rear wheels, at the rear wheels, measured on a dynamometer. Um, that's just the way it is. So two horsepower on 60. Now we're, you know, we're talking, we're, we're talking uh, not 2%, but a percent and a half of the increase. So that's a lot. So there's no substitute for the factory air cleaners, none, zero. Now, if you put dual carbs on a later car, uh, take the Stromberg off and you put dual SUs on there, then you use those conical filters by k and and those are almost as good. You can't put the other, you can't put those uh, radius things in there anyway. Um, so the, those k and uh, those conical ones are almost as good. Um, and you're, you're right. Um, um, Doug, you're right. The, those those pins do have more of a movement than what, whatever the workshop manual asks for. It does, um, just because it's just a you know, it's a gross uh, it's just a a gross crude um, checking tool. You know that you can reach down under if you can get your finger on them. Uh, sometimes the linkage is in the way, um, but anyway, yeah, you can you can use those. You know, but if you're really doing a good tune up. You're going to take the air cleaners off, and then you're going to go out and drive it. Afterwards, you are going to go out and drive it, and then because and if the RPMs change, then you can always experiment with the mixture a little bit. I mean, if you got if you got a sniffer to go up the tailpipe, or you've got a wide band oxygen sensor uh, welded into your exhaust, oh my gosh! I mean, that just makes it uh, makes it a dream to tune. But this is uh, this is tuning by tuning by by ear and experience. So. Okay, Ken, if we don't know what oil's in the carburetor, what's the best way to remove and replace with 90 weight? Well, um, usually the 90 weight comes with a little tube on, on the end, you know, like a, you know, a little tube. And you can just stick it down in the top of there and squeeze, just squeeze and it'll, it'll, it'll barf out some of, that, some of that other stuff. I mean, you could get a long straw, <laughs> there isn't much oil there, um, um, or just mix it up with, with the 90. So, eye dropper, Eric, thank you very much. That's very nice. Uh, is there a need for a fuel filter on a TD beyond the screen mesh where the fuel line enters the carburetors? Yes. And there, therein lies a problem. So, with, with all of our cars, um, we've got form. And we've got function, right? Um, you can have the nicest looking car in the world, just gorgeous, and it runs horribly, you know. So the function isn't there. The brakes don't work, something, right? Um, but when you go out in the field with your TD and you want it to look all real nice, you don't want some <laughs> some plastic filter dangling, you know, up by the carburetors. You don't. So this requires that you find an old fuel line cut the ends off, put rubber hoses on it, put the, put the uh, uh, fuel filter between the pump and the carburetor while you're driving. And when you get to the show, take your 3 8 BSF spanner and spin that thing off and put the real line back on. You know, Don't put it underneath the fuel tank. Oh my gosh, we'd have people come in, there'd be a fuel, you know, nice fuel filter on the bottom side of the tank. Well, how do you change that? Because, you know, the moment you extend your arm and get a, two drips of gasoline, it says, where's the underarm? And runs right down your arm and nothing burns. Well, there's parts of your body burn a little worse than, than your underarm when you get gasoline in them, but not much. That's, 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 don't ever put it underneath the tank. Oh, my gosh. And Alfonso, should we use resistive? Uh, 
easy for me to say. Resistor plugs and wires together. Sure, you can. Um, it, um, uh, your timing line won't work unless you got resistor wires, um, I discovered. Um, so in the case of an MGB, which originally took N9Y spark plugs, and then pretty soon they were N9YC because some part of it was copper, I don't know what. And then they became RN9YC for the resistor that was in them. Now they're too complicated for the clerk at Walmart to get in the right bin, so they changed the number to 415. So 415 is the champion spark plug. Some people say, oh, should I use Nip and Denso spark plugs or should I use Atlas? Do they even make Atlas spark plugs? Um, you know, and, and people say, oh, champion spark plugs are junk. They're not junk, they're just fine. It's, besides, you know, it's what the car came with. It's what it should run with. I'm, I'm not keen on platinum plugs, that's for sure. Because once those things foul out, you can't, they won't, they won't heal. They won't, they won't burn out again. Modern cars, uh, you know, they, there's always the exact amount of right to get, the exact amount of gasoline going in. They don't foul. But um, my experience with platinum plugs is, is awful. So I, I, I like just old fashioned, old fashioned spark plugs, but resistor, yes. Malcolm, any opinion on gross jets versus needles and seats? Um, yeah, I'm back to the Viton tipped needle and seat. They originally, when they came out, they were steel tipped, had the steel cone on them, the AUD 9096s. That was the needle and seat. And then the Gross family, G R O S E, out of Connecticut, Massachusetts, started making this double ball uh, needle and seat that was better than the steel AUD 9096 needle and seat. It was dramatically better. Then I don't know what happened. Old Mr. Gross, we used to write checks to the Gross. To the Caroline talked to Mrs. Gross when she ordered, ordered them. And then, uh, then I don't know. Then the old man got too old, or their family squabbled. They didn't make them anymore. So guess where they come from now? You know, same place that brought us COVID. So, um, so they aren't as good as they used to be. And now, uh, and gasoline is sticky. After six months, it can get sticky. So a needle and a uh, uh, gross jet can uh, can get stuck in place. Now all you need is a screwdriver handle and bang, bang, bang on top of the carburetor, and it, it'll loose, loosen it up uh, and work. But um, the Viton tipped needle and seat is the cat's meow. Those are available from Joe Curto. That's what I, I like. From Mike, when rebuilding the carbs on my TF recently, I found that there was some gray sludge lurking in the bottom of the piston cylinder. Uh, so I soaked both pistons and parts fluid overnight to loosen it up and then flushed the, the sludge out. Uh, Mike, where, where's this in the bottom of the dash pot? You hit your space bar. And then you can talk to me. You don't, you don't have to say, stay silent. I'll hit your space bar and hold it down. Well, that's not working. Okay. There yeah. you go. Yeah, that's what it was. Oh, okay. Well, the reason that I ask you to put that 90 weight in there is because that, you know, the, the, the valve is brass. And it's not the valve that moves up and down. It's the piston that moves up, up and down with the valve in place. And the valve is a one-way hydraulic valve. It's a shock absorber. And the, the brass valve um, gets little pieces of dirt in it. And then that abrates the steel on the inside of the dash pod. And so the dash pod is no longer parallel, but um, worn out here. Um, and the um, and by putting thicker oil in it, you make up for that extra, for that wear. And that wear is what fell down into the bottom of, into the bottom of there, is that that was oil and, and um, an old steel sludge, I'll bet. Yeah, very, very fine stuff. It was. <laughs> sure. Yeah. But it, 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 there was, there was quite a bit of it in the bottom. And I was, I was concerned that that might 
uh, foul up the, the, the new oil that I was putting in there. Uh, so I just cleaned the whole thing out. Well, cleanliness is next to godliness. I tell you, just whatever, whatever works. You know, whether you whether you use your kid's toothbrush or you use some um, cotton cotton wipe swabs or or I mean, there's all kinds of stuff you can find. Um, um, cotton swabs you use in your ears that the packages don't use in your ears. It's like, well, so why are you selling them? You can get them uh, with great big long uh, sticks on them, and you know in put some kind of fluid on them and go on and clean that stuff up. Air, of course, air, we used air, compressed air at the shop. That was our friend. You know, you'd spray some carburetor cleaner down there and you'd have a, a tube about that long, a 3 16 um, one eighth inch tube, 3 16 on the outside, hooked to hundred pounds of air pressure, stick it in there, put whatever was on the bottom, um, suddenly was again, you know, was against the wall or on the floor or on you. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, while while I'm not muted, yes. I will I will uh, give you an update. Last fall, you uh, inspected a, uh, an MGA for me, uh, MGA coupe, and we we did a little work on the engine. Um, you were concerned that it was idling roughly, okay. and uh, uh, after I got the the door lock fixed and was able to drive it. Uh, uh, I found that it was really running roughly at, at just about any speed. Um, I uh, switched plug wires with my wife's MGB and got it running on all four cylinders. And uh, But it was still running very, very roughly, even with that, but at least it was on all, all four cylinders. I pulled the plugs and they were so black with soot. Uh, I've never seen plugs so uniformly black uh, ever on a car. Uh, so I cleaned them up. Uh, I, I uh, leaned out the, the, the carburetors three flats each and uh, put the plugs back in and, and, uh, and ran the car. And now I've got a medium brown uh, plug. Uh, is, that, is that clean enough or should I lean it out a little bit more? No, oh, that's fine. That's fine. That's that's the you're looking for khaki color, you know. I mean, okay. it, it might be a little lighter, but you know, geez, the proof is in the pudding. If the car runs well, um, then that'll be okay. The other the thing that happens with the with the H type carburetors, mm -hmm. uh, TCTD TF, bug eye sprite, um, is you got those arm, you know, you got those arms are either on levers or in the case of an MGA, they're cantilever sort of, yeah. and um. um you pull the choke on and then relax the choke on the dash. But if that arm doesn't go all the way back up, I mean, if it's down a 16th of an inch, that's, that's, I don't know how many flats that, that is lots of flats, <laughs> lots of flats, <laughs> um, 10 flats or something. So it's, it's really dramatic what a, a stuck jet will do. So that's one thing that we always did when we, you know, we're, when I do, when I tune up a car, is you grab a hold of the, the choke on those and just operate it by, by hand and then, you know, pull it all, all the way and let go of it and then push underneath and see if there's any travel at all. If there's any travel after it's come all the way off, there's no way it's going to, you know, that it's going to get better just because I've tuned it. So you have to exercise it. You can use oil and just exercise it up, up and down a hundred times. And, mm. and get it loose but anyway it sounds like you've got it sorted out because if yours were sticking changing the position of that nut wouldn't have made it any difference so yeah cool well, that that mga door the, the 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 coupe door that wouldn't close properly it turned out that uh there was so much body shop dust uh in the grease uh in the in the lock in that door uh, that the the it wouldn't work properly, and I had to take that lock out and soak it in parts washer, and then and then relubricate it and put it back in, and now it works perfectly. Those MGA coupe doors are are um, boy, they came you know by by the time they got to the to the uh, uh, push push hand push handle MGB, that's a nice latch assembly. Those hardly ever fail, um, but the the uh, the T-types and the MGAs are, are with that cone. Uh, those are those are crummy, crummy at best. But those coupes, oh my gosh, you've got it's like 
two pieces of, of thin stamped steel and it's a what an eight spur gear or six spur gear or something it's just yeah. oh my gosh so i'm glad i'm real pleased that you were able to get that sorted out yeah. well i'll uh i'll mute myself and let you get on to the next people okay all right from eric Eric, what's your opinion of the color tune as a way to adjust mixture? I have an AFR gauge. Is that what you mean, or do you mean an air gauge? What's AFR? Eric, you can unmute yourself. Air fuel mixture. Yeah, I'm an hmm. AFM. Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, um, AFR gauge. So how's that hooked up? Uh, there's a O2 sensor uh, in the header. Okay. All right. So you're you're looking you're looking for your fourteen to one, and and if it, it's calibrated like that, yeah. And I've gone back and forth between the color tune and the the instrument, and I actually like the tune better with the color tune. I just find it better overall. Heck, with what the gauge says, it's, I think it's more like a twelve and a half to thirteen is where the car seems to like it. Okay. Um, well, the, the, um, the color tune, the color tune, the, the, the only real problem with the color tune is that you open it up and it's got this chart and it looks like something you get from your gas company about, you know, what color flame you should have on your stove. And they want you to get a, a towards a bluish flame um, to, watch, to watch it as, when it's idling. But that's not what you want. You want a reddish flame. You want because a bluish flame is too lean. So if you follow the instructions on the color tune, you'll adjust it too lean. So that's the that's that's my only. It, it's kind of gimmicky, but um, it's uh, you know, the other the other explanation I have is is that you know your your grandma was making making cakes, perfect cakes. She made cakes for thirty years on her stove. It failed. She gets a new stove. It's got a window inside. There's a light. She reads the instruction book. Women do that, and um, um, you know, and it's uh, you know, it says when you're cooking a cake, you know, at, at 12 minutes it should start to rise, and in 18 minutes it's supposed to brown, and all this kind of stuff. And she's looking in there; it's not doing what what the instruction book says. So she begins to alter the way she makes the cake, and of course, can never make her cake right because she's going for something that that is incorrect. So that's that's my complaint about the. The color tune they just tell you to, to get the wrong thing but i would think that when you're cruising down the road your air fuel gauge should be should be reading right around 14 to 1 and then dump dump down to 9 to 1 to 10 to 1 on acceleration well what sent me down this path was i replaced the stromberg with an su and i believe it came with the wrong jet and i didn't i just put it in the car tuned everything up started driving the car and found it had it was very lean under load, um, had a lot of trouble getting to you know full speed. It's great at idle, great when you finally got it wide open on the highway, but just wasn't pulling like it should have. It was a little gutless in the middle, uh, and running very very lean in the middle. So I I tried to tune my way out of it and finally figured out it ships with the wrong jet, and uh, I realized there was another jet in the box. You know a few months later, I was well let me try that jet. Uh, that worked a lot better, but I was kind of curious if there's a right jet, if there's a number on a right jet, so I know what I should be aiming for. It was a Moss replacement SU uh, HIF carburetor to replace the Stromberg. Uh, yeah, you, so you, don't, you, you probably don't mean you, you probably don't mean there's another jet in there. You probably mean there's another needle. Yeah, it came with a separate needle and a little piece of paper that says you may want to try this needle instead. Okay, all right. Uh, the only guy that can help you out with that and, and tell you a better needle to use would be Joe Curto. Um, Cause it, it all has, to, it all has to, you know, I, how many needles are there? 500 needles? You know, I mean, who knows what needle you, that's the advantage you've got with an air fuel gauge is, is being able to tell where it's, uh, it's faulty, but then where it's faulty, it's like, so what's the position of the carburetor? Now you got to go out and run. With a with a GoPro camera underneath your bonnet to see how far up that piston is running, but then if you're running without an air cleaner, that's not that's not the same as running with one. So yeah, it's uh, yeah. 
you have to experiment. Hey, John, well, just to uh, interrupt briefly, I'm not sure, what is a, what is a color tune? What's this color tune thing we're talking about? It's a, it's a, um, it's briefly. a spark plug that's made out of glass. And you can, you can watch it. You can, every time it, it to fires, you can, you can see into sort of the cylinder. You can see the color of the flame inside the cylinder. It's kind of cool. Um, you, you don't want to run, you wouldn't want to run it at, at high speed because um, it's not made for, for a whole lot of pressure and high speed, but just at idle, you can tell whether the mixture is rich or lean by the color of the flame on the, in, on the, on the inside of the cylinder. So it just takes the, takes the place of a spark plug. You thread your spark plug out, thread the, this thing in, put spark plug wire on it, start the car up and just watch the color of the, of the mixture. So, so I'm, I'm the, I, I tried one once and I, that was, I, I used my, you know, I'm pretty, <laughs> use my, my technique, but I, I wish I had, I wish I had an air, I've got a, I've got a, um, a stick that I can put up the tailpipe um, and, and it, it's got a readout, um, but I think it's so old that it, it takes, uh, I don't know, DOS 7.22 or something or other. It's uh, it's a pretty old <laughs> it's a pretty old system. Um, if I were still in the, still in the trade, I would have a newer one with that I could put up a tailpipe. You got to put it quite a ways up too, uh, so that you're getting you're getting uh, no outside air interference. Um, but that's that's just the the best way in the world to tell what's going on at at what uh, at what speed and so forth. So, Talk to Joe Curto, see, see if he can search out on yet another needle. But then I, Kelvin at Moss, K-E-L-V-I-N, Kelvin Dodd, he's, uh, he's, a, he's one of their tech guys. And um, uh, he's, he's real good at, at, uh, at knowing you know, stuff to do too, so. Okay, uh, Penny. Jeff, an advanced distributor, suggested I use uh, new old stock points to reduce heel wear uh, down that he sees on newer points. What do I use to clean the coating off the points prior to installing? So um, those old points, you know, they're just corroded, they're tungsten points. And if you take a piece of paper, uh, let me just look for a piece of, just to, piece of, of sandpaper, just a piece of sandpaper, and fold, fold it over, fold, fold it over so it's sandy on both sides, sandy on both sides, and have a piece that's maybe three inches long, and put the points together and just drag it through there, then you're sanding both sides of the points at, at one time. Um, you don't have to fold it over, you can do it one way and then, then, then the other, but the whole points to get them clean. Do that. Two, two, three times, and that, that that'll be nice and nice and clean. And then when you put them in, you want to look at the at the angle. You know, there, you've got the the contact breaker plate that moves on the the uh, the base plate, and that contact breaker plate over a period of time angles. So if you put the points on, then you've got the cam here and the cam rider here. So you can set the points, but pretty soon it's going to wear and come into here. So your your points are are uh, um, closing up. So make sure that the the uh, cam rider is riding square with the with the distributor cam. And then and then before you start it up, of course, put a little bit of grease around there. Just I always use um, NGLI number two lithium grease. And GLI, I guess, National Grease and Lubrication Institute, number two, lithium grease. Uh, just put a little bit of that on the on the uh, cam rider and on the cam and the distributor, and that'll that'll uh, that'll keep it lubricated. So, but just some six hundred paper will do it. Um, let's see. Here we go, Alfonso. Is it okay to mix different grease for MGB grease joints? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, most all of it's not lithium. Um, 
number two, lithium grease. But first of all, um, any grease is better than no grease. And number two, uh, number two grease is better than any other grease. But if you, if you pump it full, the problem with a U-joint is that you've got four lubrication points serviced by one entrance. So the lubrication point that has least resistance is gonna get all the new grease. But you can, you can pump it fast and get, get grease to ooze out of, out of all, all those caps. It'll, it'll be all right. Do you change your own, your own U-joint? Alfonso? You um, yes, I, I just, yes. This okay. is Alfonso, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, I just, recent, yeah, I just recently um, purchased a new um, U-joint and I replaced them and I realized it had a clear grease in it, but I don't know what it was. And I'm like, well, it seems like I need to add some more. So I wasn't sure what, what can I add to it? Yeah, that's yeah. okay. Just anything, okay. anything is fine. Yep. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome, Randy. I'm building a, a 1975 MGBGT engine. So where do you come up with a 1975 MGBGT? That's my first question. Or are you building? Randy, where's Randy? Randy. I'm, oh, Randy. <laughs> Andy, I know you, Randy. <laughs> yeah, it's the uh, 74 and a half rubber bump for yeah, GT. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, what's the best MGB head to use for a late model B? Well, you're after the biggest valves you can get. And, and you can, but any, any head, you can, get a, you can get a head from a Nash Metropolitan. And if your machine shop will open up, open up the valves, the, the Nash Metropolitan valves are about as big around as your little finger, little tiny, tiny things. Still an MGA head, heart-shaped head. Um, but that 1973 valve, the one in five eighths, is it? Um, that's that's the that's the largest inlet valve. And and since the whole secret to making the engine run powerfully is getting air in and exhaust out. You want the biggest valves you can. So I think it's around 73, 74. That's where they get the get the big valve. So you can you can install those into any head and it just doesn't make any difference. Um, you want to CC the head, of course, before you put it on and do all the calculations so that you can figure out what your your um, compression ratio is. And if you had the head um, ported, you used to say ported and polished, but polishing doesn't do much. The porting, um, the porting is really important on the exhaust side of the, of the cast iron MGB heads. The aluminum heads are are uh, they got plenty of room in there, but gosh, the um, the port that allows the the hot exhaust gases to get out of the cylinder isn't much bigger around than my little finger at its narrowest point. So there's a lot of heat that that gets um, absorbed, conducted into the into the cylinder head. And if you can get that heat out of there, you can jack that compression up to 10 and a half to one um, if it's ported well enough. And you get just nominally, you're getting five horsepower uh, for every half point of compression. That's not linear. You can't, you know, go to 15 to one and get, you know, 200 horsepower and they ain't gonna work. But, but for a little range there, you know, you can get, you can get a, a, a tremendous amount of energy out of that engine by jacking up the compression ratio. You can't do that with your original head, with your original valve um, port, because it just gets too hot and you get spark knock, spark knock and in, in, uh, detonation, so. I guess one more question is the, yeah. uh, I have a real early model head from a 64. I have another model head with the uh, emission ports in it. And I have the third head that I have available that has the uh, water jacket in the back of the head. So would the earliest model should be best? No, not necessarily. No, whichever one you can make work most easily with the least amount of money. That's all, all right. They're all, they're all pretty much the same. I mean, that's by 73, 74, they were that, that shallower, uh, larger, but shallower combustion, combustion area. 
And of course, the, that one that has the water jacket has got the different rear pedestal on it. That's the only thing you have to be careful of there. So. Oh, speaking of, speaking of one thing or another, Randy, while I was down there and I got back, I'm missing, um, I'm missing two uh, three-eighths ratchet, uh, snap-on ratchets, and, um, and my brass hammer. I think it probably left over the judge's house. But um, I'm missing two snap-on ratchets and, and my brass hammer if they happen to show up at your shop. Well, I just went through my whole shop. It's, well, actually much more better than you last saw it. <laughs> but no, I have not seen what, what tools you may have left behind. All right. Okay. But if I see him, I'll, I'll make sure I hold on to it. <laughs> thank you. Thanks hey. a lot, John. Hey, thank you. I'm gonna just a second here. I gotta I gotta get a different virtual background here. There. Now we're just back back in my kitchen now. So, all right. Um, Jonathan Morgan, what's the appropriate height for the carburetor floats? Mine are right at the top after adjusting the height of the fuel uh, in the bridge according to Dave Brown's method. Well, you've got HS carburetors? Yeah, okay, all right. So it's, you know, when you flip, when you flip that lid upside down, the float's supposed to hang there under spring tension. If the if the if the spring loaded uh, little button on the needle and seat is so weak that the that the carburetor the the float falls the float is too heavy for for that spring then you can't turn it all the way upside down you have to turn it on an angle and, and see what happens but the gap between the the bottom of the of the lid that lip on the bottom of the lid and the top of the float of course it's all upside down. But the bottom of the lid and the top of the float is supposed to be one eighth to three sixteenths of an inch. So, but it's you know it just it it depends on how the car runs. If you're out running it and you in the real trick, I mean, I mean the the proof in the pudding is how does it feel, and then number two is the color of the plugs. And if you take a run, you know you take a ten mile run that that's that's enough to to get the plugs nice and nice and colored and get the get the um, um, get them brown if they were white to start with or get them brown if they were black to start with um, but you can't you can't come back in your own garage and let the car idle for three minutes and then then check it because now they're gonna they're gonna start to get carboned up so you want to come in from a high speed run or stop along someplace along the road as long as you've got an extra spark plug or two because you don't want to break one on the road That'd be embarrassing. And um, spin the plugs out and just take take a, a look at them. They're supposed to be khaki color. I don't have anything that like a brown paper bag color. That that's nice. I mean that that's the, those that's just sort of a perfect perfect color. So, uh, John. Yes. Um, so you're talking about rotating the floats. Would that help possibly? Oh, I'm sorry. You've got a fifty three TD. Yeah. Oh, after all that, I'm sorry. So that's uh, on a TD, you've got inch and a quarter carburetors. You got HS2s on that. Yeah. So that's supposed to be three eighths of an inch, right? The bar that goes. Right, but I'm a lot less than that. I'm very, very much to the, close to the top to get the fuel at the same, right level on the bridge. Okay. And okay. I'm wondering, are my floats, should I adjust them or what would cause that to. The proof is in the pudding. You got to go out and run it and pop the plugs out and look, look at them and see. Okay. Get, and because you you're going to get it you're going to get it adjusted at idle, but um, you know by lifting the air piston, and on yours you can do it if you've got if you have the original air manifold on there with the oil bath air cleaner. Oh my God, that's such a terror! So you need um, here. I'll show you the special tool. Just a minute. Oh, I don't have it. a paper clip. Take a paper clip, straighten it out, put one L in it. And there's a there's a, a single hole. Well, there's a hole on each side of the carburetor. You find it, and you can put it through there and lift up and touch the air piston. Right. I know, I know the hole. Yeah. Okay. Um, and but anyway, take it take it out for a run and just just 
look at the color of the plugs because it might be that it's idling great, but out on the road, it's, it's too rich or too lean or something. So, so that, that would require some more fiddling with that. But I, I've, never, I've never adjusted the float height so I could, for the depth of the gasoline and the jet. I've never done that. I, I've just always followed the, the factory information. And it's always worked for me. Okay, because it's running rich. It kind of has smoke out the back. If I, uh, when I started up and I was trying to get rid of that, I mean, if I'm sitting next to a bunch of motorcyclists at a stoplight, it's kind of embarrassing. Then, then put, put some, yeah, put, put some more distance between the, between the, the uh, top of the, top of the jet and the fuel. Okay, thank you. Okie doke. Mike, tire depth gauges have measurements in 30 seconds of an inch. Back in the 70s, an MGC, MG Car Club member suggesting using a tire depth gauge to set the initial jet depth from the bridge when rebuilding SUs. Okay, works like a charm. Very little adjustment of the nut is required uh, to get the mixture just right. So I, it, it, that's, it's just another, another way to get to the same end. I've never used that before. I know I, I, people have talk, I talk to people about it because they'll call and they'll say, oh, you know, how many flats down should, should I start, the, start my adjustment? And I say, I don't know, three full turns. How's that sound, you know? And then um, you just have to start cranking it back, back up to wherever, wherever it runs the best. Remember, between every single adjustment you make on the carburetor when you're adjusting them, you got to rev it up and blow it out. Ram, ram, let it come back down to idle. Um, now, what, the, I, what I forgot to put in there was that the, what he suggested was 330 seconds. So when you use that tire depth gauge, you're, you're just, you're just using, get, taking it to the three on that, uh, okay. on that gauge. And it works, it seems to work very nicely. Right. Every time I've tried it, I've, I've been within one flat or so of, of, of a perfect adjustment. Nice, okay, hey. Yeah, I've, I've just never used that. I've just never, ne never done that. I always just wing it and di dial them in, you know, but interesting, 330 seconds. I'll keep that in mind. Okay, Andrew, my question's about emissions. I renewed the charcoal canisters on my 79 midget per your terrific video. Um, and you renew them or you unscrew them and, and, and um, um, reactivated the charcoal. Anyway, while reinstalling the lower one, I discovered that one hose off the canister was not attached to anything. I found another off the top canister that wasn't connected to anything either. They're, they've just been tucked into the fender area. What if anything should I do with these? Okay, so I'm gonna, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I can open this, this uh, just a second, I'm gonna, Is there an anti-run-on valve on, on your on your car? I'm, I'm sure there is, isn't there, Andrew? Yeah, on the uh, the top canister. Okay. Okay. And the, the the hose off of that that's not connected to anything has a metal dongle coming off of it. One goes the... to the fuel. I mean, I mean. One carburetor is the bottom of the first carburetor is open to the air. Yeah. And the two small holes should be plugged. The middle hole in that first canister should go to the bottom of the second canister. And the top of the second canister has three connections. One is to the fuel tank. 
whatever whatever line comes up from the fuel tank. One goes to the um, to the um, carburetor um, float bowl, and the other one goes to that T fitting that goes between the the valve cover and the carburetor. So um, trying to picture. Uh, um, so anyway, the, the, the first, the, the, the lower, I'm, I'm just guessing here, the lower one feeds the upper one. And if there in an only, the only the middle hole in the bottom one should go anywhere and that should go to the inlet, which is the bottom of the top canister. So the bottom canister, the bottom, the bottom of that is open because that, that's got to be open to the air to draw air in. And then um, it goes through the charcoal there. And if the two lines, the two lines out on the edges are open, then the air can go in there right up the middle and it doesn't go through the charcoal. So those have to be solid, those have to be blanked off. Then the middle one goes to the bottom entry of the, of the other canister so that all the air going into the second canister has to all go through the first one first. And then the second canister, one, one of the small lines goes off to the steel line that comes up from the fuel tank. The other one goes to the carburetor float bowl and the middle one goes to um, the, the larger hose that goes that connects to that white plastic uh, T between the valve cover and the and the uh, right rear of the carburetor. So talk to me tomorrow about it because I'll, I'll I'll have a, a better picture of it. I don't I um, I've got the I've got the manuals. If you, if you call call me tomorrow tomorrow afternoon. I'll um, I'll pull out the manual and take take a, a look at it and just make sure that I'm I'm telling you the right thing. I don't get too many too many call uh, too many questions about the the uh, the canisters there, and I'll also take a look at those pictures. I don't I don't know if I can do that. Let, let me just let me just try this. Oh, I cannot minimize when I'm recording, so I can't I can't I can't look at your pictures here. But you can send those to me on email. And I'll I'll uh, I'll I'll take take a look at those later. So, right. So we are at on the end of our chat section. So now we're going to open it up to any questions about anything that you might have. Um, hey John, I got a quick question. I uh, had asked this question uh, in one of your text sessions a year or so ago, and I misplaced my notes. I've got a seventy-four MGB and the uh, backup lights are not functioning properly. And you told me there's a e pretty easy fix to get to the switch. There's like a switch that needs to be replaced. Could you go over that again? You got a, what year, 73? Uh, 74. 74, you got overdrive? Uh, no. Okay. So underneath the car, um, there's a big long cross member that supports the, the rear of the transmission. And just above that on the right hand side on the passenger side, on the tail housing of the of the of the um, gearbox is a switch and the top of the switch is about as big as a silver dollar. It's got two wires that go to it, green and green and brown. And it's right there, it's accessible, you can see it. It, uh, it comes in, if you're sitting in the driver's seat, it comes in at about one o'clock into the, into the top of the uh, gearbox. So you can put a pair, of, you take the wires off it, um, put a pair of pliers on it, turn a millionth of a turn. It's got a real coarse thread. It's a 14 by 2.0 metric. It's a real coarse thread and, and it just spins out. You can get a new switch um, and put the new switch in. And then the question is, how do you shim the new switch? So if you put too many, you'll see some shims in there. Maybe you don't need any, but um, there may be some shims in on the old switch. 
the idea being that if you don't use enough shims, the reverse light is on all the time. And if you use too many shims, uh, it never comes on. So you have to get, you have to select the, the right number of shims. And um, so it, it takes two, two people or three, somebody sitting inside, you know, pulling it in, in the reverse. You don't have to pull it back into reverse and just slap it over, just slap it over mm -hmm. into the reverse gate. Car doesn't have to be running. Um, but that's, that's the only reason that the reverse lights might be erratic unless it's a wiring connection. And, you know, those wires get pulled off the bottom of those reverse lights real easily in the trunk. Anything you put back there, it starts banging around and the wires come loose, so. Yeah, my wires are on. The problem is the lights are staying on regardless of whether I'm in reverse or not. Okay, so, um, so that's so offensive to, your, to the guy riding behind you at night that temporarily you can go to the uh, gearbox loom, which has got three wires in it, a green, a green with brown, and a, uh, okay, I can't remember, it's a seatbelt seat belt, uh, warning thing. And uh, find the green with brown, and that goes from the gearbox loom into the rear loom. And that's at that great big jumble of wires at the rear of the right front, the right inner fender. Um, um, right underneath the charcoal canister, right behind the fuse box. There's that big jumble of wires between the main loom, rear loom, and gearbox loom. So find the, find the green with brown from the gearbox loom that goes into the rear loom. Gearbox loom has got three or four wires. Rear loom has got, I don't know, eight. And then the main loom's got a hundred. <laughs> so they're, they're very distinct as, as far as their size. Anyway, find the green with brown and just pull it apart for now, or disconnect your lights in the trunk, pull, pull, the, pull the plugs off those yeah. ones, so you're not blinding the guy behind you. But it's a real simple, easy. real simple matter to change. Real okay. Is that like a uh, switch you find like in a Moss catalog probably? Mm -hmm. Yep, no. yep, yep. And it's, um, uh, it's, a, it's the same switch for reverse and for overdrive. So. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Yep, you're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, let's see. Uh, um, Joe Curto, yes. Uh, Joe Curto is in College Point, College Point, New York. I went to I went to his shop. I I, I, I uh, my daughter was living in New York City, and and uh, I said, hey, let's go visit Joe Curto. So we got a, took an Uber and. And drove over there and walked walked in the door. So I got lots of real good pictures of Joe Curto and me standing to, together. So yeah, lots and lots of carburetors there. Oh my gosh, he used to do a lot of other stuff too, but he, he just does carburetors now. Nice guy. Once you get past the gruff part, so if if you were in the Navy, let him know that right away. <laughs> He'll be your friend. <laughs> Okay, somebody else has got to have a question. We all have, oh, we all have MGs. We also have to start talking about mission 1500 engines. It's like, I got a call on that today. I, go, I got a call today from a guy named Alex. He says, do you have any ARB um, studs for an MGB engine? And I said, well, first of all, let's just back up. I said, unless you're building like a race engine, you don't need them the factory studs are just fine. You don't even have to replace the factory studs. They're just excellent. Um, and he said, well, in fact, he wasn't building a race engine, but somebody in England had called him and said, can you find me a set someplace in the States? Apparently the, the supply chain has failed for ARB studs. What else? Then I got another call from a guy who uh, is in Utah and the car ran real crappy, so they rebuilt the engine, still ran crappy. So then they sent the distributor out and it still runs crappy and they rebuilt the carburetors and the car still runs crappy. And it's so frustrating because I'll talk to the guy tomorrow, we'll probably get it sorted out, but um, everything I asked him, yeah, I, yeah, we did that, you know, it's all great. And I said, well, what's stuff down inside the exhaust? Oh, we changed that too. You know, it was crappy before and it's crappy again. And it's going to be something really stupid, simple, like 
like um, the condensers bad in the distributor. And he'll say, well, the, the first condenser was bad. So we put another condenser in and said, well, yeah, you got two bad condensers. It'll be something like, like that probably is spark plug wiring orders correct. And I, I said, well, what about cam timing? He says, well, I put another cam in it too. It's like after you rebuilt the engine? I don't know. So anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting, the struggles that some people have sometimes trying, trying to get this stuff sorted out. Talked to a machine shop yesterday in California that was doing a midget 1500 engine. That's really a Triumph Spitfire engine. And the bearings aren't anywhere nearly as wide. The engine is not as durable as, as the, BM, the old BMC engines are. Uh, the A-series engine that they used in the midget um, and uh, the minis. And then the B-series engine that they used in the MGA and the MGBs um, and the magnets and, and uh, Nash Metropolitans and the Leyland tractors. I mean, that thing was a workhorse. Um, but anyway, he was working on this midget 1500 engine, and there's a couple of problems there um, that if you get a rod failure, it's always number two or number three, because the oil supply isn't, isn't enough, so you have to open up an oil gallery, and then uh, there's no cam bearings in the engine, they just run a, they, they have a steel cam that runs uh, in a steel block, um, and that works for a while, but then eventually, <laughs> I mean, eventually the oil can't keep up with it. So I said, well, you want to put in cam bearings. And then of course the cam won't fit. So you're going to turn down the, turn down the journals. One of them has a spiral groove on it so that you get a pulse of oil up to the rockers. And then there's a, another problem with the 1500 engines. Um, our engines have got thrust washers in them to keep the crankshaft from moving back and forth more than a couple thousandths of an inch. And our thrust is taken up on the center main. But on a Triumph engine, it's taken up on the rear main. And instead of having um, two, two thrust washers, they only have one. Well, one front and one, one rear. And um, so the, the, the trick is to put two in on the rear, because that's the only place that it ever gets wear. When you press on the clutch, press on the clutch, you're pushing the whole crankshaft forward into the engine. So anyway, we talked about that. So all uh, kinds of uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, Alfonso here, I have a question. Um, um, recently, um, about a year ago, I replaced the cross member bushing and I replaced it with rubber. But then over the holidays, I was looking at it and the rubber started to deteriorate. I'm like, is this where you have aftermarket bush rubber that doesn't really work well? Or So my question is, What's, you know, in light of not knowing what type of rubber bushing you're getting or whatever, what's a good rubber bushing to replace the cross member with? It's something this, that is the last one year. this is the cross member that holds the front wheels? Yes. Oh, boy. That's a hassle. Um, two <laughs> yes, of, it is. Two of them are a, a, a slam dunk, you know, but the other, the other two, you got to take the spring out to, to get up in yeah. there to hold that. Hold that nut! Oh my gosh! So um, I just did I just did a seventy three BGT for my daughter last year, and I put red bushings everywhere. I put them in the A arms. I put them at the front of the re rear leaf springs. I tried to put them on the back end of the gearbox, but I, maybe they didn't have them for that right then. But I did use them there. The, the only offensive part is that they're red. They're real nice. Oh. It, so you said red. Is there some significance between? I, I assume that's polyurethane bushing. It's something. It's something stiffer than than the rubber. I, why can't they make good rubber stuff? I just I I, I don't get it. You know. Yeah. We had uh, we had a customer who's doing a TR3, and I mean it was taking him a long time. He'd been working on it for twenty years on and off, mostly off probably, and and. <laughs> And he was starting to have to replace things that he'd already changed, you know? And it's like, we used to take rack and pit rack boots off an MGA that were original. I mean, you could tell that just the way they were installed and what they were and the clamps. Yeah, that, I noticed that also on the rack. It's like everything that I'm purchased or replaced that is rubber, 
anywhere, it just like a year or two later, it start cracking. And I'm like, yeah, it is. It's, is I, it it's just crummy stuff. And I don't know why it's always okay. done that way from, I, I assume you're purchasing it from the major supplier. Yeah. Moss. And it, it's just, it so, just seems like anything with a rubber. Just, so just there is a, there's another, there's a rack and pinion boot that you can get from Napa that fits a Ford. Just a minute. And I'll give you the part number on that just for fun here. I got to look on my phone because that's where I keep all my secret stuff. Just a minute. Uh, just a minute. I just got to find it. It's a Napa part number. You can go to Napa and buy it. Instead of being, you know, $15 for two, they're like 35 bucks each. Oh, no. It's not here anymore. Must be your, your phone only takes so much information and after a certain amount of time, it, it, uh, it dumps it. It used to be on here. Here it is, here it is, I got it, I got it, I got it. 269-1507, uh, 269-1507. And that's a, a rack boot from Napa that fits some kind of Ford. I don't know what kind of Ford, but it fits a Ford and it is durable and it'll last forever. And it's, it's, it's what, I mean, the cost is a, even at 35 bucks. I mean, if you get to send, spend 70 bucks for a pair of these and they last a long time forever, what difference does it make? It's a whole lot better than spending 15 bucks for two of them and have to change them in two years. Is it such yeah. a hassle to change them? All right, thank you. Yeah. I, I, again, is this all the rubber? Even the even the grommet on top of the um, valve cover. Again, I a lot of these are replaced in less than two years, and they just start deteriorating. And so like, you can. There are other places you can buy parts. Now, there's a um, there are a lot of Moss resellers. Uh, Little British Car Company. That's a Moss reseller. So if you order from him, you're going to get. You're going to get um, moss stuff. <clears throat> There's Engel, E N G E L, in Kalamazoo, Michigan. They're the, like the second biggest importer of British parts in the nation. You'd never know it. They don't have a very high profile. But um, Engel, E N G E L, Engel Imports in Kalamazoo, Michigan, right down the road from us. And they have a di some of their stuff is different from moss, some. You can always go to any uh, a couple sources in England. There's no problem ordering stuff from England. In fact, it'll come the same day or a day later than stuff gets shipped to you from uh, from uh, uh, Peterborough, um, Virginia, from Moss's warehouse there. And so you can go to MG Owners Club in uh, Svezi. It's a mouthful. S W A V E S E Y. Svezi or Svezi, Cambridgeshire, MG Owners Club. You can go to, um, there's Moss. <laughs> there's Moss in England, and they're not the same. It's the same company, but they don't all handle the same parts. You can go to Brown and Gammons, B-R-O-W-N and G-A-M-M-O-N-S, Brown and Gammons. They're a real high-end, um, good supplier of MG parts in England. And you may be able to get different stuff. I just don't understand why the stuff that we, because the stuff you, the stuff I bought in 1980 failed in three or four years, and it's still failing in three or four years, and I don't get it. I mean, come on, guys. I mean... So anyway, frustrating. Okay, no, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I was kind of curious why that is, but it seems to be across the board. Thank you. It does. For, for what it's worth, uh, uh, a few years back, I was able to get uh, steering rack boots from a Saab 99 that fit uh, my TD. Uh, and that'll fit an MGA and an MGB also. But okay. uh, uh, there was you. a right one and a left one. And they were not the same. Uh, but the, one of the, one of those was was the right size for TDs and MGBs. The TDs and the TDs and MGAs. This this um, the tie rod is maybe a sixteenth or an 
eighth of an inch larger than it is on a B. It's 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 the next incremental size, probably sixteenth larger. So that that ends up, and then and then of course there's the size to go over the over the end of the rack itself. So yeah, thank you. That's in Saab ninety nine, one side or the other. <laughs> okay, yep. Can I ask one, John? Sure. Yep. I got two questions for you. You said you worked on the front end of your daughter's car. Would you have an interest in adopting a 73-year-old man? <laughs> uh, and then maybe I could get you to work on my car. <laughs> hey, you know, when I was when I first came to DC, I, I got to uh, I stayed with Dale and Jennifer, um, Dale Moore at Buzzards Gap um, way back in the day when uh, um, Motorhead was still operating. And there were a bunch of British car shops around, but I, I know you guys are down to about two places in the in the greater metropolitan area there. Right. Um, I know it's in it's I, I know that that's why that's why I'm popular when I come down, you know, because I don't I don't charge a $138 an hour. Um, and I do it usually, usually do it right the first time. Um, so uh, yeah, I <laughs> no, I, I got I got I got I got a midget I gotta get done. I've got a midget here for a long time. I got a 75B in my shop. I, I took pity on the guy and told him I and I doing a whole lot of front end work on that. I had my daughter's car. I mean, I the 73B GT. She wanted one. And I said, well, you know, we could buy one for, you know, go to the used car place and buy one that's just drop dead gorgeous, you know, for 12 grand. It's got all the stuff wrong with it, but just fix it, you know. And then I thought, well, you know, let's buy one for less and do more work on it. You know, I'm a glutton for punishment. So she found one for, I don't know, two grand. They had it shipped here from Northern Wisconsin. And in the end, we took the whole car apart, didn't take the headliner out. And we didn't take the side windows off the car. And we didn't take the chrome strips off, didn't have it painted, had the underbonnet painted. Um, but the, the, the outside of the car looked fine. I mean, it just looked fine, but stripped every single nut and bolt off that car. The front suspension, the rear suspension, the engine, the gearbox, the, the dash, the steering column, handbrake, handle, everything, everything was out of that car. And then renewed and put back in place. What a project. Took me the better part of a year um, on and off. Towards the end of it, mostly on. <laughs> I was she was getting kind of antsy. So and I and I put air conditioning in it. Um, so she's got that out in Los Angeles now and drives it on the weekend. You know, looks cool. So all right. Now I have a real question. The MGA that you worked on here for me over at uh, Sean English's house. Yeah. Put, yeah. Um, it's out at Randy's right now. We're doing a few things to it. But I took it for a, for a ride when we first got finished up there, and it ran good for about four and a half miles. And then it seemed to get starved for gas. I just barely made it into my daughter's house. Um, any thoughts on where that might be? I mean, we had it at Randy's, and I put it in the driveway. We started it up Jeez. and let it run and run and run, because I'm thinking, man, maybe it's just pulling a piece of dirt up into the line or something. You got any well, other thoughts on that? Um, there's, a, there's a big difference between idling, which takes hardly any gasoline at all, and right. running at speed, which takes a whole lot more. So right. you take the line off the carburetor, put it into a can or a bottle, and turn on the key, Tick, 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 tick. You should get one pint per minute. Okay? Right. Okay. And if you're doing that, I mean, you know, that tests the pump and the tank and the filter. And yeah, pump out, pump out a gallon if you want. You know, um, when you get, there's no way you're going to get a vacuum inside that. That's the one I put that other carburetor set on, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it ran, it ran, you know, it starts up easy, it runs great. Yeah. And then I took it on that, the first long ride, five miles. And at four and a half miles, it just started running on about two cylinders and I barely made it into the garage. Is, is it, is it run, is it run, it's continued to run bad since? No, I haven't taken it for a ride since it's been uh, sitting out at Randy's right now. Okay, all right. Because it could be, points could have closed up a little bit. I mean, it, Maybe it's not the fuel, maybe, okay. you know, but it, it's, um, um, anyway, it's, 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 
probably not the engine, it's either spark or fuel. So, so it ought to be pretty easy to eventually, once you get onto it, I'll talk okay. to Randy about it too. So. All right. Thanks, John. Hey, thank you. Thank you for dinner. I'm, I'm sorry that you're not interested in the adoption though. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I just had, I just had lunch today with Mike who, uh, who worked my front counter and he works for Forrest now. And I said, how are, you know, how are things? Oh, cars are backed up all over. He said, we, we just, we just took one in. The guy bought it, uh, the, guy, the owner, the new owners from California. He bought it from the auto gallery here in town. It's a high-end place. They, they sell nice cars. And uh, so apparently the guys bought this thing sight unseen, right? Any, any, it's, um, uh, I don't know what color the car is now, but it's got rubber bumpers and, and steel wheels. And he gets it out to Forrest. He says, so I want wire wheels on it and I want chrome bumpers. And Mike, <laughs> Mike told me today when I was having lunch with him, he says, I, I told him, he says, you know what my boss said, if, if you want, if you want a red MGB with wire wheels and chrome bumpers, buy it a red MGB with wire wheels and chrome bumpers rather than changing the, the whole thing around. So anyway, that was, it was nice to, nice to see him, him today. They're, they're real busy out there. Forrest has got a gal who works for him who is Ukrainian. She's 25 years old. She's adopted out of, out of Ukraine and uh, by a single mother uh, with whom she doesn't get along with her seat anymore. And now she wants to change her Mac her name back to her Ukrainian birth name. Mike says it's got about 26 consonants in the, in her, in the last name or something. I said, well, is she ready to pick up a, a rifle and go back to Ukraine? He says, oh, almost, you know. So good gal, Nadia. She does a really, really nice job out there for, for uh, Mike and Forrest. So anyway, I'm way off this subject. <clears throat> We're talking about an MGA that wouldn't run, so. John, I have a question for you. We, yeah. we, we have a, one of our club members has a 1969 MGB GT right-hand drive that he bought out of England. And the car was almost over-improved, you know, where they start putting in LED headlights and LED parking, you know, lights and so forth. And he's been blowing out headlight bulbs. And uh, I've looked around the car, he doesn't seem to have flashing lights in the back, you know, bad ground, but those parking lights of his in front flicker on and off all the time, even when the engine's not on. So I'm thinking it's probably a bad ground, but I don't know where the ground connects on a English MGB GT for that front it's wire. Body. Everything's grounded through the body. So the, the, the taillights are, you know, when you tighten up the, the, three, the three nuts that hold the the lamp assemblies against the body, that's the ground. And in the front, um, the housing, the housing that carries the that carries the bulb and the and the uh, lens on and so forth, that's got studs that come out of it and they got nuts on the back of them and that grounds to the body. Sometimes when you can't get a good ground, you gotta take one of those nuts off, put a black wire, I always use the right colors, a black wire with a ring terminal on it and then push it through the same grommet uh, that the rest of the wires go and, and hook it into the rest of the grounds or put a ring terminal on it and put it underneath a, a, a some kind of nut or bolt or something up in the front of the radiator. Um, it's odd that it's blowing out those things. So I'm wondering if the voltage in the alternator spikes from time to time. I don't know about LEDs. I, they, they're new since, since I left the trade. It's um, um, when my daughter was going to college in 2006, she's a, she's a, she's a chemistry gal. And, the, and she came home and she's talking about light emitting diodes. It's like, what? I mean, all of a sudden, you know, it's just the whole world has changed. So I don't know, but I like any other bulb, you put too much, too much voltage in them and they pop. So I expect LEDs are like that too. Um, and uh, it'd be interesting to put a voltmeter between the, oh, say the, the top fuse and the fuse box 
and ground because that top fuse I think is the is the uh, purple is the brown purple set up there and and just turn the lights on and turn stuff on and and uh, rev it up and down and see the voltage ought to be at 14 volts and not very more than a couple tenths of a volt should be just steady steady but if it's popping if all of a sudden it spikes up to 18 volts or something um, that might be what's popping the popping the front bulbs and that'll also eventually uh, ruin the battery mm -hmm. so a complete electrical service starts at the battery um, and you you know you take the clamps off the battery and you make sure the 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 uh, uh, ground connections are good back there and most everybody runs a single 12 volt now a group 26 interstate battery uh, some people still have twin sixes but you if you got twin sixes you just got to make sure that the all the clamps are like really really tight i mean they you know like take them off the battery and clean them up with sandpaper spread the clamps and put them back on there and then go to the starter motor that's where most of the problems come in those those cars is at the starter motor at the solenoid and drop the main battery cable which is like as big around your little finger and then there's a bunch of brown wires there too pull those all off the stud tighten up the nut underneath the stud at the solenoid, put all those wires back on and crank the thing down tight and then clean the fuse box. And uh, that usually takes care of about 99% of, of all the electrical problems in the, in the car. You clean the fuse box by, the best way is just sandblast it, take it off and just sandblast it. But if you don't have sandblasting stuff available to you, you can take it in the house and your wife isn't there and put it in the bowl and put some ammonia in it. And that'll that'll uh, jiggle all the all the junk off it. Although at our last um, um, Zoom session, my normal Zoom session, we we're talking about plating and electrolysis. And so you can unplate, <laughs> you can clean up a fuse box uh, by um, by putting uh, baking soda in a in a in a tin. You just go on the go on the web and you can see how to hook something up with a simple six or 12 volt battery and get stuff real, really clean, really clean. But that's what you have to do on that electrical stuff is get stuff really clean. So those are just some guesses. All right, I, what I did, I have one of these little uh, voltmeters that you stick into the um, cigarette lighter. Okay. And it can do a constant reading and I've never seen it spike over 14.6. Okay. But I don't know how sensitive that thing is either. Well, it's yeah, it's, if, I mean, it's you know, some if it's a twelve dollar Harbor Freight voltmeter, it's only so good. But but still, I, you're looking for a, a a bigger push than that. I think I don't know how sensitive LEDs are. I don't know. I, I've never never even considered it. I my first question about and I, I hadn't heard about. I I still run uh, Sev Marshall halogen bulbs in my car. Um, and I know you can still buy 6014, no, 6024 halogen bulbs at Napa um, instead of the old 6014 incandescents. I don't know. I'll, I'll get back to you on that. We'll see what we do. I have a, a quick question. The first quick comment, I've been running 100% LEDs in my car for over a year. Yeah. And only, I know I'm an electronics engineer, so I will tell you that you could probably go to 24 volts without blowing most LEDs. So it's more likely cheap and expensive eBay parts because I've gone through a couple of those have a very high failure rate. But normally an LED would probably outlast the car at this point because they really don't fail very often. So my question though is about brakes. Um, I've recently over the last year replaced master cylinder, booster, uh, the uh, calipers in the front, rotors, um, new brake pistons in the back, uh, new shoes all the way around, bench bled, the, the master cylinder, it's a good quality, original type master cylinder, no modifications to the system. Um, but I get a very hard pedal and a very poor stopping distance even after replacing everything. And, and I'm familiar with, with how normal MT brakes are. These are just not quite stopping the way I think they should. And there's not a lot of fluid 
coming out the, the bleeder valves, even though I've replaced everything. Um, and I'm just curious whether there's a common blockage point, failure point. You know, I've, I've looked at the junctions um, and short of replacing all the lines, um, I'm kind of at a loss to see, well, it doesn't really act much better than the old system did. And uh, don't want to keep throwing price at it. The brake, you know, the brakes are only so good, but there should be a dramatic difference in how the pedal feels. What, what year is your car? It's a 79. There, there should be a dramatic difference in how the pedal feels if the engine's running or not. I mean, when it's when it's not running, the pedal should should move just a little tiny bit and be just rock hard. And then when the car's running, the pedal should be much softer and have a much farther travel. Yeah, I'm not getting a significant effect from the booster. Okay, so. Um, so now the question is, are you getting vacuum to the booster? Um, I, I, you think you are, of course, because you got a hose that runs there. Um, you can always replace the hose and put a, put a screen door spring down inside it to keep it from collapsing. Uh, if, you, if you just use another hose. Um, it's, the original system had two one-way valves, one in the inlet manifold and one in the servo. I'm not sure that all the brake boosters come with the right length of the push rod that comes out of the front of the servo. But you always do the cheapest, easiest stuff first. So how much brake pedal free play do you have? Uh, it's about, a, about an eighth of an inch. Okay, you might, you know, you might just for fun increase that, un unscrew the, the brake, the brake uh, switch, you know, a, a bit and just see if you can get a little more uh, 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 free play and see if that makes any difference at all. If, if it's adjusted correctly, it won't make any difference at all except increase the free play. The next thing is how far does the push rod come out of the brake servo? And it's supposed to come out, I don't have the figure, I'll have to look it up. Um, uh, do you have a factory workshop manual? Yes, I do. Okay, it, it's in there. It's like 0. 0.409 inches, 0. 0.049. There's a 49 in it. Doesn't doesn't come out half. Maybe it comes out at half an inch. Maybe it's 0. 0.490 something or other. And that that's a critical measurement. I mean, they they tell you in the in the workshop manual, plus or minus, you know, just a, a couple thousandths of, of an inch. So um, you might check that adjusting it. At, there's a little tiny uh, little tiny uh, hex down on the inside of the of the servo, but that's the only thing that I can think of that would cause a problem. I mean, when you when you open up a front bleeder and depress the pedal, it should move. Um, it isn't going to move all the way because the brake, the rear brakes are still working, but it should move, you know, solidly half the half the half the distance, half the distance to, to the floor. And it should put out quite a lot. Of, I'm what what's quite a lot of fluid. Um, tablespoon, at least a tablespoon of fluid, you know. Um, but it bothers me that the brakes aren't working right because it, the most important part of the car is the brakes. So um, the only thing that goes wrong with the servos is that they leak and they'll hiss, um, and that and that uh, and then it makes the car run real poorly at idle because you're getting all this extra air leaning out number three and four. Are you got you still got your Stromberg carburetor on the car? You got dual? No, it's, it's got a nice fresh SU and it is a new servo and a new master. Um, I am a little intrigued at the check valve on the manifold. Um, is that, um, I had never considered that. So that's that's kind of a new well, there's thing. A, there's oh, a check, valve, check valve there and there's one in the in the servo. So if you if you take the hose off the one in the manifold, you should be able to blow into the manifold, but not suck out of it. And um, in the servo, it's it, it's going to be real hard. You, you shouldn't be able to blow into the servo. 
um, but you should be able to draw some air out, out of it. You know, um, not a whole lot because it's a trapped container there, but you sh should be able to get some out. But that's, um, you always do the cheapest, easiest, simplest stuff first, you know, and, and taking the master cylinder off to measure that push rod to get it, to take all the lines loose, and brake fluid all over the place. And what a hassle. So, um, but I, I don't know. Yeah, you want to check all, the, all that line. You want to make sure the line is open. Um, you know, it, it hasn't collapsed, that the inside diameter hasn't collapsed or something, but something's wrong because you should have, you should be able to lock up those brakes just effortlessly. Yeah, I've never been able to lock the brakes since the car, since I've owned the car the last couple of years. And I, I stop okay, but it bugs me that I, no matter how hard I push, I can never get them to stop rolling, even at a, you know, just 10 miles an hour. I mash them down. I cannot lock them. I'll I'll stop quickly, but I'll never lock them. Yeah, you should be able. You should be able to lock them up. Should, unless your tires are like really, really good, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So okay, and then well, I, yeah. um, we had a uh, we had a um, seminar oh a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, and the other the other complaint about brakes is that the uh, they squeal all the time. Everybody's complaining about the brake squealing. And there is a, just a minute here. I'm looking for the, oh, I, uh, why, I just can't remember the name of the pad, but I think you get it from uh, AutoZone, Duralast, something like that. And the guy that uh, that drives a lot, and he's got like 500,000 miles on his B, he and his wife drive all the time, e everywhere. Um, they're, um, he, he swears by these things and that they don't squeal and, and you only have to buy one set because they're guaranteed for life. It isn't very often that you go through your front brake pads, but it's not with the kind of driving that we do. But I, I want to say it's Duralast. I, I just, I, I can't remember. And I can't, I don't find it in here, but I, I ought to have it by tomorrow. Is it an insert that goes behind the shoe? Say again? Behind the pad? Just the front pads. Yeah, but it's a, like a little rubberized plate that goes behind the pad to absorb. Well, the I, I don't know how, I don't know why they don't squeal. Uh, it's, it has to do with their composition. Um, I think I, it, it, they, they might have uh, some sort of rubberized coating on the back to cut down on the vibration. But I'm just embarrassed here that I can't come up with that name because I, I've been asked it two or three times, and then I, my daughter complained, said that her car, the brakes on that were squealing. Anyway, brake switch adjustment. Uh, make sure that the make sure that your uh, line, your your vacuum line, is free, and um, okay, you, have, you have to take that master cylinder off and check the length of the push rod. They're all good things. Okay, dog. Doesn't seem like the parts, so there's got to be something I haven't changed. <laughs> yeah, uh, John. Yes. Uh, Bruce McMillan here, down in God's Country, Northern Neck of Virginia. Uh, with regard to the gentleman who's still on my screen, I have the same problem, but it's intermittent. Uh, Pull out uh, the brake pedal down my gravel driveway, thank you, is rock hard, but I don't skid it out. Drive it a bit, and uh, all of a sudden the brake, I get the uh, uh, brake pressure is normal. I get effective brakes, and I've not dug into the thing. It's a 79 body uh, vacuum, and it's running off the uh, manifold, so it, it comes and goes on me so yes. i don't know whether uh you know, he has the same problem or 
but it's intermittent and sometimes it scares the hell out of me when the guy in front of me is slowing down yeah the, the most important part of your car um yeah so anyway same thing brake uh the, the brake pedal switch on the back of the master cylinder box <clears throat> and then um the hose, you know, and the hose and the one-way valves um, in the manifold and and on the on the body of the of the uh, servo, make sure that hose is, is open. But yeah, you want to you want to get that sorted out. It sounds to me more like something's plugging up the hose on yours, Bruce, because it just why would it be intermittent? But I, you know. Well, Ed, I've got other problems, so if you don't mind me getting a couple of questions in here. No, that's fine. Okay. Um, it, let me give you a rundown. Uh, nice looking car. MGB, uh, GB engine, AUD 135 carbs. Uh, not sure of the distributor on the thing. Uh, it revs high, so I think I may have a vacuum leap or follow some of your earlier discussions. Uh, the first question I have is, uh, the idle's running high. Okay, go back in there and work that. It's surging at cruising RPM. You know, you're blowing up the road, 3,500 RPM, whatever. It's overdrive, Franny. And it starts surging, pulsing. The ignition does not seem to cut out. This, you know, is, is basically a... Uh, well, I'm going to let you tell me, but uh, I'm getting good uh, uh, fuel pressure through the, uh, uh, you know, pull the hose off and I get the one pint. Okay. And accelerating, fine, but it's it's pulsing, you know, surging at a, a steady RPM. Now you're, you you would you would ascribe the surging to the engine and not not something having to do with the overdrive. Uh, no, I'm just cruising along either in overdrive or out of overdrive. Okay, all right. Well, if if it seems if it seems like um, there's a wind against you or you're pulling a trailer, especially oh, an MG. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> especially if you hit a real slight incline and the carburetors kick on you and go, um, that's an indicator that you're too retarded. Uh, your ignition okay. timing, your ignition timing, not you, Bruce. Um, your ignition timing is too retarded or you're too lean or both. So uh, timing, timing is critical. So get a dial back timing light and make sure that your timing is 32 before at full mechanical advance vacuum disconnected. Oh, uh, I just bought the uh, dial back timing light today. Okay. Well, that's it. So, uh, so just, that's the next step. Yep, and you can use um, uh, a paint pencil or people say, oh, use whiteout. It's like, who uses whiteout anymore? Um, but my late wife was the last one to use 23 column journals and whiteout, but she didn't have whiteout. She had like a uh, yellow out. <laughs> go on, go on. Uh, white, white nail polish. Okay. Lasts a lot longer. Okay, right. Um, let me see. There's just, okay. Um... I'm probably buying parts, you know, just having fun. Yeah. Picked up a uh, 40897 distributor. Excellent. Going to need rebuilding. That's what you want to send it to either Jeff Schlemmer, an advanced distributor, or to Rob Medinsky at British Vacuum Unit. He's closer to you. He's in New Hampshire. British Vacuum Unit. It's a funny name, but he started making vacuum advance units first. And he'll set that thing up. That's the best distributor you can possibly get. My well, question, yeah. yeah, question boils down to, you know, look in the sucker. It um, has the screw in uh, vacuum advance fitting. Mm -hmm. And I would just as soon not run pipe back to the car. What you can use what, what vacuum? Uh, advance would replace that particular one or can that particular unit be stripped out and rebuilt to have a vacuum hose instead of the pipe i uh, just use a hose on it now just no the problem is it's got a screw thread it's got threads well that that'll that'll hold a, a, a tube better 
So, okay. um, so you, you got the tube on the other end, of course, which is tiny, oh, sure. you know, on the top of the top of your rear carburetor. Um, but if you, if you uh, warm up a piece of, of, uh, vacuum line, warm it up on the, on the end of your torch or something rather, you know, and, and, uh, you might be able to press it over that or go to a swap meet and buy the nut and just that much of the, of the, um, uh, original, uh, tube right. in the pipe and, and just, just run a, a piece of black hose. But we, we ran the hose all the time, uh, just hose on those. Okay. Well, like I said, uh, I was planning on sending, you know, I picked this thing up and I looked at it and I said, oh, yeah. uh, what I do have in there, I haven't pulled it yet, but it sure as hell is not a, a 4087. Yeah, that's, a, that's the, um, that was the best distributor. You know, the cars ran the best 63 through 67. And then starting in 68, they had to, uh, they didn't care how well they ran. Well, they did a little bit, but they, they, had, to, they had to pollute correctly. And the yep. easiest, easiest way to achieve that is changing the ignition timing. And that's why there's a different distributor almost every year from 68 through 80. Yeah, it, uh, anyway, uh, like I said, I've got a, uh, the GB engine uh, in the uh, 79 body. So you have a Smith PCV valve on that? How do you vent your car, how do you vent your engine into the, into the carburetors? <laughs> you ever heard of a draft tube? Okay. All right. So uh, it's it's a bastardized mix. Okay. And All right. What I'm trying to what I'm trying to go and tell me if I should stop is right now I got a draft tube coming out of the crank, you know, vent into the uh, and the uh, uh, canisters are still in the car, hooked up, kind of ugly looking rig, but you know they're stuck. You know, so I'm getting that. Where I want to go is uh, drill out the. Uh, uh, Smith valve port uh, and thread that out at five eighths uh, by I think 18 and put a Smith valve in there and run that draft tube back in there. Yes. But, but I don't have a spare one of that particular manifold that has the uh, uh, brake vanicle uh, brake. Talk, uh, talk, to Randy. talk to talk to Randy. He I, I bet I bet you can come up with some combination of of uh, manifolding. And there's a, there's about 20 different manifolds, I swear. Um, and there, there's got to be a manifold that'll accept both the Smith's PCV valve and the fitting for your booster. There's got to be. But anyway, um, uh, you want to get that. Um, what you can do is just drill it half inch, 7 16 and then tap it quarter NPT and put a just a quarter inch NPT pipe in there. And that, that'll accept a piece of half inch heater hose. And put that on the bottom of the Smith's PCV valve, so you don't have to make a great big hole, just a little tiny hole, orange and NPT, and um, and just to use a pipe nipple there. Um, but get that in there, and then I think that takes because uh, that w without that you want to use you you should be running MB, um, Mike Bravo needles, and then um, once you get that Smith's PCV valve in there, I think you use number fives. I think fives or sixes so don't mind me i'm just writing notes here thank you hey that's okay uh, anyway so you know it's the car is new to me and uh outside of trying to fix the clutch hydraulics which just failed thank you in the garage uh we're going to go back in and keep on going one of the most difficult and frustrating things is to bleed the clutch and remember that that um, um, you can if a, if any part of the of the clutch hydraulics is loose enough, it'll draw air in but won't leak fluid out. So you can look at all the joints and go, well, it's not leaking anywhere, but you can't see that it's leaking air. So if if you're trying to bleed it and you can't get all the air out, it's because air is getting drawn back in, you know, on the back of the master cylinder, there's a, a banjo fitting that's sandwiched with two copper washers. And that's got that five eighths, uh, five eighths banjo bolt that, that fits into the back of the cylinder. And then that line goes into it. 
just loosen those both those up and tighten them both back down and then loosen and retighten the the line that goes into your flex line make sure your flex line is tight going into the into the um uh slave there's a problem with some of the new slaves not all of them just some of them that the bleed hole isn't at 12 o'clock it's offset a little bit so you end up a little bit of air in the in the in the uh, cylinder even though you're done bleeding it um so the the very end you know you you open the bleeder and by hand push the piston and the arm and the push rod and they push it back into the cylinder and in so doing, it, it causes such turbulence at the end of the end of the hydraulic cylinder there, it'll blow all the air that's in there out as long and, and not bring any back in as long as you're real fast with a wrench and and uh, get that thing closed be just before you hit bottom. So there's a lot, there's a lot of hocus pocus in uh, in getting those. It didn't used to be so difficult. Um well, yeah, yeah. Uh... I'm the guy who had to change the uh, clutch slave cylinder out in the middle of nowhere in a cow pasture on an MG car club run. Everyone loved you. Uh, no. <laughs> well, Everyone I didn't left. change it. I didn't change it when the guy in the MG Magnet came by and gave me and BJ a ride back into town. But I went back out there and was down on the ground in the cow pasture, changing out the clutch slave, and it worked. Okay. Thank you. Hey, you're very welcome. So I'm I'm game if anyone else has as a okay. question. John, uh, yeah, I had put something in uh, in the chat about uh, points. Uh, it seems that the, the 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 points that we get these days have got a, a fairly soft plastic rubbing block, and they wear down so darn fast. Is there a brand of points that uses a, a harder rubbing block, like a Bakelite rubbing block, like they used to? Um, Napa Napa sells a series of ignition parts under the trade name of Blue Streak. Oh and, yeah, and so you can you know you can you can get half the stuff for your car from Napa. It's sort of weird. Even you go in there and you got some 18 year old kid that hasn't got a clue what you're talking about. But if they spend enough time with their catalog, they can find the listing for you and get your points and, and a, maybe a condenser that works, maybe not. Um, I think they all come from the same place. And, and uh, maybe you can get a better one there. Or you could call uh, Schlemmer or Rob Medinsky. Schlemmer used to sell the whole plates the 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 um, the whole plate assembly with it with the points and condenser right on it and a low tension lead um so i don't know i don't know i, I this may be a, a newer problem since i i left you know full-time full-time work you can call down to glenn at glenn's mg service and ask him what what points he uses he he doesn't use napa he uses a world pack Something like that is it's the name. I don't anyway. He gets lots of his parts from there and they're good. They're good parts. John? Yes. Can I ask you a question when we were talking about bleeding the clutch? Yes. A number of years ago, I rebuilt the master solar and the slave cylinder, and I had trouble getting the clutch bled. And in an old, I think, Michigan Rowdy's book that was about an inch thick that had a black spiral binder in it yep. i found an article about bleeding the clutch and what they said was that the clutch doesn't have a check valve in the system but the brake system does and what they recommended was to run the line from the slave cylinder over to the right brake cylinder and to bleed the clutch system through the brake system and it worked fantastically. Okay. And it was all, if I recall correctly, and I don't remember things all that well now, but it seems like that because of the check valve in the brake system, it kept, it, it uh, removed the air from the system. That's a messy that job sense? to do on an A. So I, I, uh, I tell people to, you know, you get the whole thing in place 
and uh, make sure that all your lines are really tight. And then take the bleeder out, take the bleeder out of the slave and use your finger. And for the first five or six pumps, finger off, pedal down, finger on, pedal up, and count out 20 seconds. One, two, three, I won't do all 20. You get the point, <laughs> 20 seconds. Finger off, pedal down, finger on, pedal up, wait 20 seconds. After five or six pumps, when you, when you take your finger off and the pedal goes down, you get all this fluid out. At that point, you put the bleeder in, tight, pedal up, wait five seconds, open, down, close, up, wait five seconds, do that two or three times, it's all bled. Just, just like that. I, I'm, we always use that at the shop. That worked out real well. Oh my gosh, I, you know, I talk to people I, on the phone and they say, oh my I will gosh. Send you, I will send you this article and I, I tell it. you, it was so easy. It was no fingers, no fluid yeah. out anywhere. It was just connected over to the brake uh, cylinder and pump a few times. So I will send you the articles because I, I, it, it worked really great, even for an old lady. <laughs> I've got that book. I've got the A Antics book. So it's in my, in my um, MG library. So thank you. I'm still game. If anybody's got, got any questions? Uh, Jim, Bruce here again. I've got your 1980 uh, workshop manual and I would appreciate it if you could update that sucker. How so? Well, there's got to be some additional information from 1980 until the <laughs> university manual that you could put in there. Yeah, yeah. I just, yeah, I know. I just got done with five weeks in Gulf Shores, and I was going to work on my my tech book. This is my. I, there's one for sale on eBay right now, but it's 93. This is the two. I don't think I improved it much from the 2005 edition. This has got a laminated cover and spiral on the back. I just haven't got around to printing another one yet. You know, just not yet. I, I mean to do it. I mean to do it. I, I better do it per, pretty soon because everybody looks like we do, you know, in, in, in a couple of years. Although Mike was, when I had lunch with him today, and we were talking about the guy from California who bought the MGB that was, uh, the wrong bumpers, the wrong wheels, and the wrong color. It's like, why? Anyway, he said he was 34 years old. Yes, yes. And uh, Daniel Harrison, did anybody see uh, Daniel Harrison with his uh, silver MGA on um, um, J the Jay Leno program? That's great. Um, I think Daniel Harrison, I met him at the, at the NAMGAR meet in Solvang in, when was that? Same time the MGB meet was in San Diego, um, at Coronado, uh, maybe 2017. Daniel Harrison was like five years younger. I mean, he was just you know, a, a teenager. And he, he brought this MGA back, sort of back from the dead. And here he is on Jay Leno talking about, you know, talking about the his MGA and Jay Leno's out driving it and everything. So yeah, there's, you know, there's, there's some hope here, you know, we got to get the younger people involved, but uh, we don't know how younger people think, apparently. Can I asked Liz tonight to send me a copy of that article too. Yes. Actually, um, Ed, what I was thinking of is, um, while I was sitting here is uh, finding it and putting it in the edition of the Spark when we talk about the Zoom call. Oh, super, thank you. So everybody can have it. Great, thank you. Uh, Bruce here again, uh, down in the garage or next to the garage, Gunston uh, pressure brake fluid thingy. Yeah. It actually did work in that cow pasture. I couldn't get anyone to go out and roll in the dirt with me. Yeah, <laughs> yep. the gun, Gunson's Gunson's bleeder. Yep, we had <laughs> we had some at the shop that we sort of made the homemade ones. But um, yeah, the the only problem is with brake fluid, you've got to be so cautious 
because nothing works faster than than zip strip except brake fluid. And so you just spill it on the fender, you spill it on the under bonnet, you know, and if you're using silicone fluid, hey, that's that comes with its own problems. But um, uh, it just makes it can make such a mess. So that's why we always we oh in the shop, we always did two person bleeding, bleeding brakes and bleeding clutches. Just steady, just, you know, we had the technique. We just knew how to do it and, and zip, zip, and it was done, so. But the Gunson's power bleed, yep. That's the whole series of, of uh, first, when I was in England, when I worked in England, the, uh, the aftermarket people were Krypton, K-R-Y-P-T-O-N, Krypton, and they made all kinds of tune-up accessories. And then the click torque was, was uh, exciting too. And then um, that gave way to Gunsons. And I think it's, uh, I think that the, uh, uh, isn't the spark plug the, the, the uh, Gunson, 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 yeah, Gunson. Yep. Gunson too. Yep, yep, so. So I'm expecting to be down there, um, but I don't know when. I've got I've got an engine that belongs to Sean English, and um, and either I don't know whether I'll build it at Sean's or or I, I don't I don't know yet. But I've got I've got it all. I've got a little most of it here. I got to get it all prepped so that when I come down and with, with it in the back of my car and lay it out on two great big tables that we can assemble it within within uh, two days and get it running up on the bench. So, Enters at my yeah. house, John. I'll make that. Well, you can swing by Randy's again. and pick up your tools. Well, <laughs> I don't you know. It's like Sean's got a Sean's got a nice place, but it'd be hard to get twenty people in Sean's, especially if it rained or something. You know, we could get twenty people out of Randy's, um, but Randy's up. Uh, you know, like ninety-eight miles away from from everybody else. It seems you're M Midland. Is that correct? Midland, Virginia. Yep. Third is uh, 15 miles west of Manassas. Okay. I was I was on a map. I thought, well, where does Randy live? And I'm looking around, and all of a sudden, I had to look an inch to the <laughs> inch to the west. You know, and said, really? I know we drove for a long way to get out there, but yeah. yeah. Well, just look for the orange mailbox. It's the only orange mailbox out here. Okay. All right. All right. Well, it's about 9.30, so if anyone's, you know, you can call anytime. You can call me tomorrow. Uh, I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy to answer your questions, and, and uh, if, you, if you're not, if you don't already get the, um, uh, a reminder about our reg uh, the regular Zooms, um, then you can, um, I, still don't, I still don't have any color. God, white. Um, if you don't get the email for my Zooms, go, go to my website and, and fill out the join, join our newsletter. And then, then you'll get the, the official Zoom invitation. I, I put it up, I used to put it up on Facebook, but then I got Zoom bombed one time. Oh, it was great. It's just tremendous. <laughs> just so, so raw, so rude, so awful. But, yeah. John, you may want to check either your camera settings or check the lens on your camera sometimes you may have a little fog on it oh you look much better really? yeah. yeah oh really I think that was it well it's embarrassing but I just, I still like to... john before you leave could you tell us how to find this uh, recording on youtube um i'm gonna have to, i'm gonna put it up on youtube tomorrow and I will send Liz a link to it. And then Liz is in charge of letting everybody else know. It'll just be a regular YouTube link. But, um, you know, it's, it's I'll, I'll just, and I'll put it, I'll, I'll, make, I'll make it public. So it'll be the Washington DC Zoom, tech Zoom or something like that. But I'll, I'll send Liz a link to it. Cool. Cool. Cool.
Well, John, we've uh, we've tied you up for a long time tonight, but uh, I want to thank you for sharing your expertise and your stories with us, which always regale us with, mm. your, with your knowledge. Uh, and I just want to say for those people who are here, at, uh, still left over from the club, uh, we have a our first driving event is coming up on March 26th. So uh, it'll be the winter romp led by uh, romp master Ted Whitehouse. So please check your uh, blast emails for more information. Those should be coming out in the next couple of days and let Ted know if you're able to come. And that's all I've got. Uh, Ken Spector? That, uh, John, that, that drive includes a stop for ice cream, I hear. Okay. So. <laughs> yeah, I think John Puglisi is paying for the ice cream for everybody too. <laughs> Thank you, John. You're welcome, Ben. <laughs> John, many thanks. Hey. Yeah, John, great stuff. Thank you. Yeah, this was great. Yes, thank you. You know, I love doing this. So thank you. Thank you very kindly for your support. Take so, care. Have a wonderful hey, evening, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, and, and yeah. look forward to seeing you sometime later in the spring or summertime. So see Let you then. Know when you're coming back. Will do. Oh, thank I you. will. Okay. Talk to you soon, Randy. See you. Bye now. See you later, John. Okay, see you later, Liz. Thanks. Bye.